so I began to think of humans more like bone than glass. Hmm. You know, we, we, we can heal, we heal stronger. We can come back together, but you have to be looking for it. Like you said, you have to want to heal. You have to want to be vulnerable and see the positive. Yeah. Everyone you meet every single day is fighting a battle you may know nothing about. We're all in the process of overcoming. I'm Justin Wren, and my story has been heard by millions of people through my book, my TED Talk, podcast interviews, TV shows, professional fighting, and my foundation, Fight for the Forgotten. I believe we are all overcomers if we choose to overcome. We all have the option. I've been given the opportunity to overcome childhood trauma, sexual abuse, immense bullying, depression, suicidal ideation, substance use disorder, and I am a two-time suicide survivor. We are here to have conversations with some of the greatest minds of our time. Get ready to be inspired and to receive the tools and game plan to win this fight called life. Thank you for being here, for showing up for yourself. You, me, we have overcome 100% of our darkest days. I'm not done yet, and neither are you. This is your invitation to overcome. We're rolling. We're rolling. Thank you guys for being here. Thanks for having us, Travis, Travis, Josh. Yeah. 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 From uh, struggle to strength. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an incredible name we're going to get into, but you guys just got off the water. Yeah. That's awesome. (laughs) And and honestly, um, we're just meeting. And yeah. I haven't had a lot of time to to do a lot of research, but I'm excited to hear all about you guys. But that name just drew me in. Like, I want to know these guys. And I'm going get to get to do your podcast tomorrow, so I'm really excited. But you just, uh, well, Josh, did you just move to Austin? So I did just move to Austin. I was living in Denver. Yeah. And Travis and I both, we were living in Denver. And my girlfriend lives in Austin. It's kind of a lot to manage a house remotely, yeah. turns out. Yeah. Like with all the travel I was doing. So we're looking to downsize our home in Denver. But in the meantime, I'll be in Austin. So I just drove down here on Sunday. Wow. Just packed up the car, hit the road and welcome. did it in one fell swoop. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's- and then you guys were paddle boarding. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah breaking Something news. crazy happened. Yeah, breaking, <laughs> breaking news. news. <laughs> I, I just started hearing this. I was You're like, hey, here wait. first. It's not even on the news yet. Oh, wow. So it's breaking on this podcast <laughs> right now. Uh, there was a, a, a plane that crashed into the river basically right when we got off of the water. Um, no one was, wow. no one was injured. Well, they were injured. No one, no one, no fatalities or anything. Mm-hmm. And it looks like the, the pilot was a um, park ranger and he was saved by a bunch of paddle boarders. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was a game warden. Game warden. Yes. Yeah. I just looked warden. it up and it was a Texas it's Parks only, and Wildlife plane. It's only on Twitter right now. No, that's that's the news over there. But, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> if anyone's going to find it, it's Amy. Amy's actually, actually got an Austin radio show. and she. <laughs> oh, really? We all were talking weather earlier. She reports on that and everything else. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So you got it pulled up real quick. I did. Yeah. If, if he wants to pull it up on the screen, we can show. Where was it? I checked In Twitter. The city? I checked Twitter first, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. It was There's actually. a picture wow. of it, just a small picture of it right there. Oh, man. So, well, yeah. I'm it's really like... glad he landed or crashed <laughs> yeah. um, near some paddle boarders. Yeah. Some good Samaritan Seriously. paddle boarders. Yeah. yeah. He pulled it off really well, didn't hit any, you know, just right into the water. Yeah. How was it? Have you been paddle boarding in Austin yet? You no. Guys? This is my first I, time here. Yeah, okay. I, I go all the time. That's my favorite thing to do. Okay. It's so peaceful down there. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And it's it's so wild because it's in nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful water. Nature, um, nature sunlight, sun, yeah, exercise. Right. Yeah. This is one of the things we were gonna we were gonna talk about. <laughs> okay. Like the 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 pillars to like being feeling mentally well. Like mm. nature, sunlight, exercise, those are you know, those you are get all three yeah. in one. It's good. Yeah. And and you're you get a beautiful skyline also right yeah. by the trees. All the and great. Did you guys get to go to Turtle Town? Where like where Turtle is that Cove? Spot? Turtle Cove on maybe? the way yeah. to uh, Barton Springs Pool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I love. Oh, so yeah. just tons of turtles underneath down, the paddle boards. We we went down to the bridges, turned around at the graffiti bridge, then went down to Turtle Cove, and yeah, tons of fish, tons of turtles, a few places you can jump, rope swings. Yeah, it's awesome. Oh, well, my first time ever paddle boarding was with Amy, and. It's definitely a feel thing because right at first I was I was wobbly mm. and then I had to get the feel down and then it was it was a lot of fun. I enjoy mm-hmm. our times going paddle boarding. Me too. Yeah, yeah. That Barton Springs is like a little tropical paradise. Mm. I didn't know my so if I this is my first time I've, I've driven through Texas like briefly um, and I haven't really been to Austin and if I were to close my eyes being in in Colorado if I were to close my eyes and think of Texas I would think like brown and dry yeah. you know what i mean yeah and I, tumbleweeds yeah tumble, tumbleweeds <laughs> yeah. you know cowboys stuff like that uh-huh. and 
uh, when we were landing the plane, I was like, this looks tropical. We've got the turquoise rivers and the, yeah. uh, it's really green. It's beautiful. Austin's a cool little pocket, this hill country that yeah. is just gorgeous. Um, it doesn't feel like Texas yeah. because I grew up in Dallas, Fort Worth and you're right. It's brown. And <laughs> I grew up in the country though. So grew up with horses, horses that, uh, on our property and calf roping and barrel racing and, and tumbleweeds would literally go across <laughs> yeah. the highway and, and hit our fence. And we have to clean the fence of, of like tumbleweeds and things. <laughs> so yeah, this is way different. I love it. Mm. Um, Austin sucked me into the vortex and yeah. Well, so you're here now. I'm here now. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, eventually, we'll. The goal is to still have a home in Colorado. I need my mountain escape. I need my yeah. snowy mountains. But big, uh, big snowboarder. Yeah, big snowboarder. Okay. But um, Austin's amazing. The Li- literally a, a big yeah. snowboarder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I used to be a very One small the snowboarder. Snowboarders I've seen. <laughs> he still moves though. Yeah. I mean, he's like cool. throwing. You know, he's he's oh, he's got the muscle nasty. to throw yeah. it around. Yeah. Still yeah. my old man bag of tricks. You know, yeah. 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 As long as I can still like show up the kids every now and then, I feel uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> so tell me some of your background because you are a bodybuilder. Yes, right. Yep. Professionally? Uh, no, not no? professionally okay. yet. No. Um, you know, that's something I don't know if I have true professional aspirations as a bodybuilder. I definitely love the competitive nature of the sport, yeah. but to take it to a professional level, my girlfriend has, has, has professional aspirations. She'll be going for her pro card this December. Okay. Um, but we'll see. Yeah. You know, still look like a professional. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. It's a massive compliment. Yeah, it takes, it takes a, a, a ton of discipline. I know. Yeah. Um, you should see the amount of food this guy eats. Ooh, I'm probably going to need to start hanging out with him. I've, I've lost my appetite these last like month month or two. Yeah, and I got to start eating because oh. I'm I'm training more a lot more, and I've I'm not eating oh. enough. Oh, to you got to eat. Me. Yeah, yeah, you got to eat. Yeah. yeah, you need fuel. Exactly. So how do you how do you normally attack food how whenever I mean? you're when you're you're preparing? Me personally, yeah. So I. I've been tracking my food for a long time at this point. So I know the foods that digest well for me. I have a number of foods that I know I can eat during certain times of day. I know that I have food that digests very quickly. Like my pre-workout is always the same, like a cream of rice with a little bit of peanut butter, some quick digesting carbs like honey and some protein powder. And then the rest of the day is mostly like rice products, jasmine rice with chicken and, you know, typical bodybuilder stuff, chicken, broccoli, and rice. It's not the most delicious thing. But you can spice it up every now and then with some sauces, add some cashews to your meat. It's going to be something a little bit different. But at this point, we don't really eat for flavor as much as this is what my body needs. Mm. I can make it taste good, and it provides me with the fuel for performance and recovery. So my, I definitely eat more than I'd like. Uh, and I know that's probably a really weird, oddly privileged thing to say. <laughs> but I, with as much food as I have to eat in order to grow – it's just not appetizing. It's not, I, I don't enjoy it as much as I, I do when I'm in a fat loss phase, for example. We well, all, y'all just touched on something earlier about sunlight, nature, movement. Now we're talking about food and fueling mm-hmm. your body. Like mm-hmm. what, are, what are some of the key things that you guys do? Because moving from that struggle to strength through the struggle, you need to fuel yourself to find strength. Yeah. And, and it's so, so, it's so easy not to. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah, to neglect yourself or to put bad fuel in your body, mm-hmm. which makes you feel like garbage, mm-hmm. affects your whole mood and attitude and the way you even look at life. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, I think that's a missing piece for a, a big majority of, and I know I fall to it pretty easily. I've, I've always been a heavyweight fighter and uh, I get away with never having to cut weight, right? And so yeah. food isn't as important. It is, it's just as important. But I don't see the negative effects of it as much as the the guys that have to cut weight. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I can see myself, well, Amy knows I love my weakness is ice cream, specifically Jenny's ice cream, the world's best ice cream. Jenny's ice cream, like from Tennessee. Uh, I think this one's from Ohio. Okay. Uh, Jenny's J-E-N-I. Okay. It's down on mm. South Congress. We can go for a flight of ice cream after this. Oh, I would love to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've never, I mean, I've never had it. <laughs> yeah. y'all, y'all should definitely do it while you're here. It's up at the domain and down on South Congress. But to get away from that, how do you how do you feed yourself to where either you're preparing to look good, but how do you do it so you feel feel good? I think one of the most important things that people these days forget about food is that. It has to agree with you. Mm-hmm. Just because it tastes good doesn't mean it agrees with you. It gives you that tip that 
initial feel good or just because it's healthy or just because it's quote unquote healthy doesn't mean that it's good for you it doesn't mean it's good for you so paying attention to how food digests and the symptoms that you're experiencing after you eat some people will you know eat quote unquote healthy food even though it makes them bloated and this happens a lot with protein powder Mm. right like whey protein another one eggs because someone told them that was healthy so they say oh i gotta eat that food that's healthy food but it doesn't agree with them yeah. So it's causing a digestive issue. And then when it comes to your happiness, 80% of your serotonin is produced in the gut. Mm-hmm. Wow. So now you're- I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah so, so if you're not paying attention to your digestion, or if you're regularly bloated, have indigestion, irregular bowel movements, gas, burping, indige- uh, acid reflux, any of these things- A lot of people feel like that's normal. A lot of people I'm think so that's normal. I'm so bloated after I eat. Dude, people don't talk about <laughs> digestion <laughs> <Okay>. as kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, why? Can yeah, you, can, like, can yeah. you not? Yeah, not, you not want to change that? that? Well, yeah. you, and you've been digging into it, right? Yeah. No, I yeah. yeah. So you you figure out that certain foods may not agree with you, even though they're considered healthy by the majority population or by society. But we need to think for ourselves. Yeah. So if you eat something, pay attention to how it makes you feel, mm. not just emotionally, but physically. Do you experience indigestion? And if you do, well, then maybe figure out why. Is it that food or do you lack an enzyme or some sort of Mm. maybe a low stomach acid situation that you need to facilitate to help you digest that food better? Yeah, Yeah. I just just went through, I'm similar to you, like for the longest time I felt invincible, you know, where it's like, I never really had to worry about my, my, what I was eating. I never had any sort of like, and it was around, so I'm turning 32 this year. It was around like 30 that all just like changed. I started getting, um, I started getting like gut problems and um, my anxiety. Like I've always had, you know, pretty suffered some pr- pretty bad anxiety, but it was like getting really bad. I was having panic attacks and all this stuff. Um, and we actually had somebody on our podcast who is a doctor of nutrigenomics, mm-hmm. and she tests for like everything she's got you know she explained all this stuff she's like she'll test like your your dna she'll test your gut she'll test uh your food sensitivity all of that and kind of figure out what's going on because she was saying like a huge portion of like anxiety and depression is linked to your gut Mm -hmm. um the inflammation like physical pains is linked to your gut um so you know I, i got to the point where i couldn't sleep for like it was like two weeks in a row i was not sleeping and my i was in so much pain in my stomach i'd have like when I was trying to go to sleep, I was, I'd have like racing thoughts, um, a lot of anxiety, crazy, like swelling and abdominal pain. And I'm somebody who like eats healthy. You know what I mean? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm eating like eggs in the morning and salmon and white rice for dinner. Like I'm eating healthy. Um, and so I set up a meeting with her and we, we did like a full, uh, a full test. We, she tested um, my, it was a swab to ch- test like my DNA, see, see different things that I'm like allergic to through my genetics, food sensitivity, gut microbiome, all this stuff. Um, and basically what we found out is I'm allergic to eggs, egg whites, not yolks. I'm allergic to egg whites, which is something I've been eating three of every day since I was 12. Yeah, you which know? people would suggest you go to egg whites over the yolks. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And yep. sometimes I put extra egg whites yeah, yeah, in. Yeah. Or just, yeah. just yeah. the egg, egg white cartons, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and honestly, to be honest, it's my favorite food. So, wow. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, very, very bummer. But it's she was bummer. like, yeah, you're actually like really allergic to egg whites. And I have what she called a candida mm. um, yeast overgrowth in my gut. Yeah. Which is basically like, it's a, it's a yeast kind of bacteria type thing that normally you have in there, but it likes to eat carbs and sugar and sometimes it gets overgrown Mm -hmm. and it's all very active at night. Um, and it starts like dancing around in there and stuff. Um, and it can even give you cravings for that exact Mm -hmm. sugar once. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, um, for the past two months up until kind of like this week, I've been on a super strict crazy diet which at first was like, how am I going to do this? It's miserable. But I mean. Which, what is it? What is your super strict? Yeah. Um, so it's it's fairly complicated, but to put it as simply as possible, it's like no sugar, no starch, no grains, no lactose, no um, gluten. Gluten, yeah, no gluten. Um, so that means like. And some of this is specific to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sure, yeah, this sure. is all this yeah, is all specific curious. to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um so and and then no eggs as well. So what is so. that? It's basically leans, greens, yeah, f- fruits mm-hmm. or no, not really because of the sugars? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I can have fruits. like one cup of berries 
Okay. Um, wow. And so, you know, you don't want to do it this. Like, yeah, you don't have to do it like forever, but you just kind of want to like kill off that candida a yep. bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been eating like a lot of um, like chicken and avocado, for instance, you know, very like kind of the same thing every day. But um, I feel so much better. Good. It's, yeah. It's, That's great. It's, That's rewarding. It's this podcast is brought to you by Onnit.com. Onnit.com slash overcome. Use the code overcome to save yourself 10% on. I'm holding in my hands the Alpha Brain Focus Shot. It's in this cool container. Amy's got the website pulled up I for do. you guys watching on YouTube. Did you drink your Focus Shot this morning? Absolutely. I, th I, I thought you did. I did too. Yeah. How do you like it? Oh my God. I feel so good. I always feel Because it's early right now energy. on a Monday. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. This is... This is one of the earliest podcasts we've done. Well, this is early for you. Early for you. <laughs> well, to, to go on the show, yeah, for sure. And it promotes focus and energy, supports a positive mood state, helps manage mental stress. And for me, I truly feel like it helps me get in the flow state faster, stay there longer. Whether I'm going into sparring, I had one before I went to sparring yesterday, and I had a four and a half hour training session because they were stacked. So I went from... 12 to 1 30 and then straight over to the gym from 2 to 4 30 4 40 came home tired last night mm -hmm. but i was focused the entire time i feel like it's very reliable about yeah. how i'm gonna feel the more i've used it the more doing this show really the more i'm able to know that when i drink it i'm gonna be on point my brain's gonna be functioning really well i feel generally good and that's been so nice to be able to know that it is not going to suddenly make me jittery or suddenly make me feel nauseous or whatever it is. Yeah, well, that, that for me is important because some of the products with caffeine, which just has some caffeine, but it's like plant-based and it's healthy and it's a low dose. It's not jittery bad. It's not jittery <laughs> at all. And sometimes I'll have, you know, one of those energy drinks or something and then I'm over-caffeinated, over-stimulated, and then I feel like I can't think as good. That's not good. Because it's, it's bothering me. Yeah. And all the Alpha Brain line is super reliable. The capsules, my favorites, the one of my favorites are the Instant, then the Black Label, and my all-time favorite is what we're talking about now. The Alpha Brain Focus Shots, they're incredibly good tasting. The tropical flavor, they also have peach, I believe, but mine's the tropical because it's passion fruit. And it delivers consistently. Fruit. And sometimes I'll take one and I'll split it between two smoothies when I make it for us in the morning. I'll just throw a little bit in each mm -hmm. and just, just adds a little something to like our protein powder and the fruit and whatever else we've got in there. Yeah, and thank you so much on it for supporting me, my comeback to fighting. Uh, fight for the forgotten and this podcast they make it possible so please support our sponsors who honestly i think have the best supplement line in the world and yeah. our favorite products alpha brain or total human get the best in one packet uh a morning support and a night support thank you thank you thank you for being here with overcome with justin wren and on it.com be sure to use overcome. that code mm -hmm. use the code overcome yep. save yourself some money Uh, I, I actually had um, Candida also like four uh, or five years ago, maybe six, seven. Uh, Dr. Eamon helped me find that. And he was saying the cravings part, but also that, um, oh, what was it? There was, there was some crazy stuff about it where, yeah, in your gut, it's, yeah, the inflammation, the bloating, the cravings for that exact food. Um, and then, yeah, it can, it can give you uh, anxiety, anxiety and um uh fatigue mm -hmm. fatigue were you feeling fatigued oh yeah 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 mm -hmm. super bloated and even just like my you know physically like i feel like i look i you know i, I was like in shape but i but like i lost a lot of inflammation hmm. you know around like my gut area um yeah yeah it's funny on on food where i mean because whenever i was growing up in wrestling i'm 35 and in high school wrestling I mean, you saw Olympians and, and then CAA wrestlers and all sorts of stuff like eating whole wheat bagels and, and pasta loading before the night before. And yeah, we had that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Pasta dinners. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't know what was going on with me, um, until years later, but I would get nauseous and I would, I would have gut stuff. I'd have diarrhea and things, uh, day before day of competition. And my dad was always like, why are you always sick? Are you nervous? Do you, do you not believe in yourself? Different things like that. And I'm like, no, I just, 
I don't know what's going on, but I'm still going to wrestle. And so end up winning some state championships, national championships, stuff like that, still through that all. But I had celiac the whole time uh, and I was eating wheat, pounding, pounding gluten. them. Yeah. yeah pounding right. gluten, uh, day oh, before man. day of, and my inflammation and my joints would just be pounding and be tired and lethargic mm -hmm. and just having to basically gut it out in the yeah. matches and try to put that off to the side. Oh man. Um, but it was an absolute game changer whenever I found out I was celiac oh, yeah. and I just have to cut that out. And I, obviously instantly know it whenever I have it now. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, I think that was affecting my mood, depression, all sorts of stuff. Your performance so, too. Performance like, for know, sure. Your cortisol's through the roof before yeah. you even get in the ring. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's been a game changer. Well, I'm excited you guys are here. What do you guys think? What was the, the genesis or the starting point, the inspiration to name your podcast struggle to strength? And can you guys riff on that a little bit for me? Like yeah. what you guys see and what that means. And because this, this podcast is called overcome mm -hmm. and it, it basically means, um, for me, it's you, me, we have overcome hundred percent of our darkest days mm -hmm. and this lives in the mental health space, but I think it's broader than that, but it's, it's really about rise up, overcome. And for me personally, a little bit of my story is, you know, two time suicide survivor and, um, all, all, all sorts of things, childhood bullying, um, and addiction. I've gone to treatment twice and, um, those have been some of my biggest battles. And in those struggles, the only times I've probably found strength is whenever I'm vulnerable or whenever I open up or whenever I seek incredible coaching with addiction specifically, I would never, I, I started going to therapy because I needed it. Um, but I would never even talk about addiction. I would just talk about stuff that had happened or how I was feeling or, um, and maybe I didn't have the best therapist at that time that would really narrow in on, uh, getting past some of my bullshit, not, not looking at the part that I said I could handle, you know, I'm a fighter. I'll deal with this. You know, I, I, and I would never mm -hmm. sought out coaching for the biggest struggle in my life, which was addiction, mm -hmm. which would lead me to depression, which would lead me to suicide attempts. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I started finally being vulnerable and seeking out that coaching, um, by people who maybe were real deal addicts and had broken free or found recovery and found how they could overcome, maybe not be totally healed, but, or cured, but healed like a broken bone. It breaks and you heal stronger than stronger. before. It doesn't mean it can't be broken again. So you have to take the right steps. Um, but I'd love for you guys just riff on that a little bit. And what does that mean? Struggle to strength. Yeah, man. So I'll, I'll take this one yeah. a little bit here because um, really the inspiration for that came to me. I mean, it started when I was young. I, I, I suffered with mental health my whole life, mm -hmm. um, suffered severely through my early teenage years and turned to drugs and alcohol and made some poor decisions and spent a lot of time hiding from those struggles and, and finding easy outlets that would give me temporary satisfaction or temporary relief. Um, and so that was always something that I had endured uh, the majority of my life. And it wasn't until uh, later on in my life, you know, not even that long ago, that I had realized the strength that that had given me hmm. as a young male to uh, endure those struggles, to endure, you know, suicidal thoughts, to endure depression, anxiety, OCD, ADHD, like the whole thing on top of, you know, trying to find my place in the world. And as a kid, it's like, you know, you try to fit in so you don't get made fun of, but then as yeah. an adult, you want to stand out. And so those are really challenging times for me. And then moving forward beyond that, I've, let's say I've been accident prone, I guess. Okay. We'll, we'll, put, we'll put it that way. I've been accident prone. Um, and so, you know, I've had numerous concussions, surgeries, broken bones. I know you guys said that. Yeah. Uh, you, you said yeah. your daughter has a, a broken ankle yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, that bone will heal, heal back stronger. And so I began to think of humans more like bone than glass. Hmm. You know, we, we, we can heal, we heal stronger. We can come back together, but you have to be looking for it. Like you said, you have to want to heal. You have to want to be vulnerable and see the positive. Yeah. Um, so important. So important. And so, you know, moving on in my life, I think uh, starting about 2014, 15, I had a, a slew of surgeries, almost like one surgery per year. Uh, ending in 2017, I had a Zenker's diverticulum and an esophageal rupture. So essentially, instead of an intestinal diverti diverticulum, 
I had one in my esophagus, and that's this scar on my throat right here. It looks like I got stabbed in the throat, which wow. yeah, if kind anybody of, asks, kind of you did. If anyone, I did get stabbed <laughs> in the throat. Yeah, actually, it was a scalpel. Yeah, yeah. it was a scalpel. Yeah, when uh, so I had my surgery, and it was an expert wielding that. Knife. Yeah, it, it, it was. <laughs> it was stabbing. Yeah, there was four of them. I had that surgery, and a, yeah. like a a month later, it ruptured, and mm. the next wow. morning I was rushed to the hospital. I. I mean, my throat was swollen all the way out. I didn't have a neck anymore. It went from my Oof. chin to my chest. Um, and at risk of going septic, they didn't have time to bring me into a room. They just put me on a table, held me down and cut my throat open wow. to let the the infection out. Um, so gnarly. Yeah. And then from there, I was I had a feeding tube for a few months. I was on a liquid diet for a few months, soft food diet for a few months. Couldn't lift more than eight pounds for over a year. Wow. Uh, so couldn't work out, which was my yeah. thing. It was my, my, it was my mental health outlet, training and snowboarding. So I didn't have that. Wow. So I kind of lost myself and I lost a huge sense of my identity. Couldn't snowboard, couldn't be the snowboarder, couldn't be the weightlifter, couldn't be the bodybuilder. Uh, you know, I was like, who am I? And so I did a lot of digging, traveled the world for a while. Um, and I came up with this, this concept that, you know, every challenging part of my life, every time I've endured something and I haven't given up, I've become a little bit closer towards the person that I want to be. Hmm. So every struggle I've endured has led to the strength that I've been looking for for so long. And so the concept of struggle to strength is like, without struggle, there is no strength. Mm. And when you know struggle, you know strength. So our motto is kind of no struggle, no strength. Mm. And the, the play on words being that if there is none, there is no strength. If there, And if you know it, then you will know strength. I like so that. That's kind of where it came from. No struggle, no strength. Yeah. No struggle. Mm -hmm. no, no strength, strength. yeah exactly that's great man yeah i love that yep. and so on just two things that kind of came to me real quick to ask you said you didn't know who you were um so who who are you and and who is that man you want to be so now i've done some exercises and, and worked through a lot of this with therapy um, in fact, we've had some people on our podcast that have helped me through this, Great, which is really valuable. Yeah. Um, shout out to Jay Thuft, who uh, does a lot of mindset stuff. Um, so now I like to think of myself as I, we all have several identities. You know, I have part of my identity as a bodybuilder. Part of it is a, is a snowboarder. Part of it is a brother. Part of it is a son. Part of it is a partner. Part of, part of it is a, uh, a step dog dad, you know, now <laughs> and, and a homeowner and a business owner an entrepreneur, a lifelong learner. You know, I have all of these different parts of me. So if I ever feel as though one is slipping or I'm losing one, or if I am competitive and, you know, get onto a bodybuilding stage and I don't win, my whole life doesn't come crashing down. Right. Because at that time in 2017, when I lost myself as a body, as a bodybuilder, a weightlifter and a snowboard, and I didn't have those things. I didn't see myself as a partner. I didn't see myself as a brother. I didn't see myself as all of those other important parts of my identity. And that led to a severe depression. And historically, my tendency when I would encounter things that I didn't quite understand, emotions that I didn't understand about myself, growing up, my tendency was to run away. So as a, as a kid, mm -hmm. as a young child, I was running away a lot when I didn't understand my emotions, um, physically running away. Yeah, And... Um, I didn't realize until I was halfway on, across the world that I had ran away. Hmm. So I had ran away and I was finding different parts of myself. I was a traveler at that point. Um, but now I think it's important to have a good grasp on these different parts of your identity so that you don't lose yourself. So right. that when things don't go to plan or when you don't feel as though you're performing to the capacity that you want to in one area, that's okay. Because you're still making progress in all these other parts of your life. You still have all these good things that are going for you. You're still desired as a human and needed by people and contributing in a positive way to so many other parts of your life and other people's life. And I think especially when it comes to mental health, that's a really important perspective to have. Yeah, it is. Fightfortheforgotten.org. You can go check out Fight for the Forgotten, the foundation that I started. It is my passion project. It is something that I love so much because of the people we get to help. We get to help the pygmy tribe who adopted me in help themselves. We say opportunity is greater than charity. Charity can be great, but opportunity is just always better. That's why we've drilled something like 80 water wells already, providing over 30,000 people clean water, 
We've started sustainable farms, bought back over 3,000 acres of land for the people who originally owned it, put it in their name. We built 32 homes, and now we're about to start a health center, a school, and a marketplace. They're gonna have a maternity ward, a pediatrics unit, and a dental suite. You can join the Fight for the Forgotten Fight Club at fightfortheforgotten.org. We would love, love, love to invite you on this journey to join this fight arm in arm with us. Our fight club, it's a monthly giving club. You can give $5 or more a month, and that empowers us to empower people. Thank you for being on this journey with us. I invite you to come along for the ride. It's been absolutely epic, putting love and compassion in action and fighting for people. Fightfortheforgotten.org. Join our fight club. I think about it and just some of the guys I know and, and love and have seen, you know, they're only a, a wrestler or only a mm -hmm. fighter mm -hmm. and on, that's all they have. What happens and when you get hurt? Yeah. I mean, 90, there was a stat, 90 or 95% of pro boxers retire with nothing. MMA is a little better than that, but um, I've had friends in the NFL that, that retire and then it's almost like a midlife crisis, right? And I, I can relate to that because at 23, went through addiction so hard, um, basically got kicked out of my fight gym, a fight team. I was with yeah. Trevor Whitman and, and all those guys up there and they took a vote. And these are some of the, I mean, UFC Hall of Famers, champions, uh, top contenders and um, really incredible guys. And I could barely show up for myself when I had a fight. And then when someone else did, a teammate to help me get ready for a fight that they might have a world championship fight coming up. I'm in my MIA because I'm a runner too. And when I use a run, cause I don't want anyone to see me. Mm -hmm. And I came to the gym and I think it was a vote of like 34 to one or 32 to one wow. that I was off the team. Wow. Only guy that wanted me to stay was Trevor Whitman. Really? Yeah. And mm -hmm. wanted to give me a second chance or get me into treatment. And it took me f something like 10 years to finally go to treatment. But I found purpose through the nonprofit. That really helped me a lot. They invited me back a year later. But I guess at that time, I basically had a midlife crisis because I was like, who am I? I, I was the bullied kid. And I thought that if I could become a fighter, I would never be bullied again. And then I guess internally, I didn't, my, maybe I didn't have the words for it, but it was like I was bullying myself through addiction and other things. And I just, I lost myself. And I went through mm -hmm. a year or more of... I mean, it was already three or four years of probably like identity crisis and the lowest of lows, but mm -hmm. it was, it was really hard. And I, I think that, I think people need to know that there's, every person is multifaceted and there's so much to us and mm -hmm. you're not just one thing. And that's why, I, that's why I want to ask that question because it's like, I can tell you guys are deep souls, deep thinkers, like good dudes. And I think oftentimes in our culture, we just ask the question of like, what do you do? What, yeah. You know, what do you do? Yeah. And that's like so surface level, top soil. It's like, let's do let's so go. many yeah. things. Yeah. 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 And, and we I, are so many things. Yeah. Yeah. You know? and I'd rather know who you, who you guys are yeah. than, than what you do. And so, one, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I love about um, that topic and that podcast, like for me, I'm someone who's like Josh has had kind of it seems like you, you guys both understand this. Like you've had that kind of like rock bottom moment um, that, may, you know, maybe maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't necessarily know your experience. I know for Josh, he had that like rock bottom moment that made him realize what he wanted to do in Excel. Um, I've never really like had, you know, a moment like that. I've definitely had like my moments here and there. Um, but for the most part, my life has been, uh, you know, good. Like I've got good, you know, parents and that sort of thing, but I still s like struggle so hard. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the things that um, is fascinating to me. Like, I think if you look up the statistics, um, you know, if you look at like deaths of despair, so it'd be drug overdose, suicide, stuff like that. It's like overwhelmingly middle-aged white men. That's like the, that's like the, the majority of, of people who, um, have, who are involved in like deaths of despair, but those are like, at least on paper, the people who have the easiest lives, right. Or like they're in the mm -hmm. biggest position of privilege. They have kind of the, um, you know, the theoretically the easiest lives, but that clearly leads to, you know, you know, issues. And I think that that's one of the, the things that we like want to show and talk about with our, with our podcast as well is that like, 
every you know everybody is struggling and if you are in a position where things are super easy for you sometimes that's like the worst place that you know that you can be because if you're like if you're really struggling in in some way you know if you're able to get through it at least you have like the strength after it but if things are just kind of like you know, mediocre, uh, terrible. Like that's honestly, that's like some of the worst place that you can, that you can be. Yeah. That's a very interesting point you brought up because, um, I mean, it almost goes to if, if you've had this life of privilege, then seek, seek struggle, right. seek, seek discomfort. discomfort. Yeah. 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 And it's unique. You said that because I think about it and I just remember, and I think I've shared this on the show before, but, uh, whenever I told, uh, a people group I lived with, the Pygmy people in, in Congo and Uganda, when I told them about my suicide attempts, they couldn't believe it. Yeah. I mean, they were blown away and they struggled mm-hmm. more than I ever could, right? Every single day. And for them, suicide was just, it it wasn't a, an actual thing that happens. One elder out of like probably a hundred and something people had heard of someone doing it sometime somewhere in the past and didn't even know if it actually really happened, but he had said it's a legend. At that yeah. Point. Yeah. But yeah. they were like, it, it, that would hurt not just you. It would hurt your family. Yeah. It would hurt your tribe. It would hurt everyone that counts on you and depends on you and all that. And, and so it's just really interesting to see that the people that sometimes struggle the most, um, physically, maybe emotionally they, they have each other mm-hmm. and they don't necessarily struggle with the mental health issues yeah. um, that we do. But on your point of maybe saying that you haven't had that rock bottom moment, um, I think that's okay because honestly, uh, at the same time, I, I'm very grateful for my few rock bottom moments. Same. I wouldn't change it at all. Like I needed it and now I'm so grateful for it. Um, you know, I think sometimes people's bottoms are higher than than others. They don't have to go that far down the the downward dark spiral, and and that's okay. That's a good thing because um, this last time I went to treatment, Amy actually helped me go, and I remember someone saying like, "It doesn't seem like you've lost everything," and I was like, "And they're like, that might not be the best thing for you. Maybe you need to lose everything and be at the worst moment you've ever been at." And I'm just like. Yeah, you know, oh, almost, man. almost died twice like, yeah. of of, yeah. of trying to, and another couple of times of of you know accidents or or overdose and other things, and um, I was just like, man. But someone came along at treatment, and told me, hey, maybe this is your high bottom, meaning like you realize you don't want to be back in that place, and other people's bottoms, like they can learn quicker, and and the people that are blessed enough or fortunate enough or, or even privileged enough to learn from other people's mistakes yeah, and be like, okay, I, I recognize that, that my bottoms aren't as low, but that's okay. And, and I'm going to find what works for me with specifically anxiety or, or your health or yeah. whatever that is. And I think like, that's something that we, I, I just bring it up because it's something that we talk about a lot on the podcast yeah. where like I was in a position of like spiraling down yeah, and, and you I noticed that and I noticed it and yeah. I kind of like stopped myself and pulled my, cause we've talked a lot on our podcast about like hitting rock bottom. If you really want to make a change in your life, do you have to hit rock bottom? Mm. And I think this is the problem that a lot of people have, which is like, they are super unhappy with their lives. They hate their job. They, you know, they're maybe suicidal, but like everything's good, you mm-hmm. know? They're like a manager at a company. They're making like 100K a year. They're married. They, uh, you know, they they drive a, the Mercedes or whatever. Like everything's good, but like every single one of those things, they actually hate it. They hate their job. They are in a relationship they don't like you know, everything about that they don't like, but like when it's good, you don't necessarily want to change it. You know what I mean? So that's like, that's kind of like a question that we've been trying to answer a little side quest question that we've been trying to answer with our podcast is like, do you, if you hate your life, do you have to hit rock bottom, change it? And that's one of the, the, I just bring, yeah, I bring it up because it's like one of the conversations we got in is like, well, you know, thinking back on it myself, I was definitely like spiraling down with like heavy and you know, I didn't even really think about it like this at the time, but it was like heavy dr- uh, drug and alcohol use, yeah. like a lot. Um, and I was in that position where it's like, I just kind of like hated everything that I was doing. And uh, I lost my job like suddenly. And then I, it was like that moment where I was just like, you know, 
I don't know if we can swear on this, but like, yeah, you can. Okay. Sure. Like, <laughs> I'm, I was just like, fuck this, dude. Yeah. I'm so sick of this, you know? And yeah. I just was like, today's it. I'm done. I'm, you know, I, I, I just kind of had an epiphany of what I wanted to do. I was like, I don't know if this is what I want to do, but I'm at least going to try it. Uh, I went after it. And like, my life has been so much better since then. Um, but yeah, you know, I think you, I don't, I don't know if you do have to. What do you think? Do you have well, to hit I, rock I, bottom I, to make a change? I fucking love what you guys are saying. I'll, I'll go ahead and <laughs> jump in with a swear word. But yeah, I I don't. I, I think that um, you hit on something like you noticed. It, yeah. yeah. Which I think goes back to self-awareness. Awareness. And I think a lot of times, I especially in depression, but most definitely in addiction, there is very little self-awareness that I would have mm. until I was about to lose everything and everyone that I love. And, um, and so I've really been trying to take notice more and there's a great book and I've, I've read part of it. I need to read all of it, but it's a guy named Andy Andrews and he wrote a book called the noticer. And it's just, it talks about basically how this person, it's kind of a parable or story of somebody that, that got to live an extraordinary life because they took, they, they, they focused on taking notice of everything in life, like themselves, the people around them. And I might be slaughtering what the real point is, but that's what I took from it. It's like, like I want to live a life where I take notice, take notice of the person that's right in front of me being present, but also take notice and inventory of like, how am I really doing right now? And what can I change so that I don't have to go that far down um, the ladder again, the rungs? Can I remind you of that sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Please do. <laughs> Please do. We we had a little moment. Um, I'll, I'll I'll won't say the person's name, but someone that drastically helped me in my recovery. Uh, that really, really um, just spoke like it is, um, and he helped get me to treatment and. Uh, it was kind of Amy and my friend Brigham and then this guy. Um, and dude, he's such a good dude. And I think he stopped taking notice of, of where he was because he got busy and yeah. um, had all these things going. His business, his second business, starting a third business um, and doing a lot of good, helping a lot of people. And I think that would trip me up where I would just get busy and inundated with stuff and other things and giving and, and whatever it is and not, not taking time at all to notice, am I giving to myself or am I running on E right now? Mm -hmm. And so we helped um, this guy yesterday and, and now today get back into treatment, which was a huge step for him. But I, it was just a, it was a reminder to me that, um, oh shoot, like there, this is a, this is a real struggle. And if I really don't do something to stay on top of it, like he'll sneak up on you and, um, or you'll just decide not to have self-awareness and, and see all the signs when, you know, talking to friends and off, even me looking at it, it's like, man, we saw all the signs and, um, it took us getting to this point to like address it with them, but I'm so glad I'm so proud of them now. Um, do you think that's kind of a sign or a symptom of like an addictive personality where it's like, maybe you've struggled with drug addiction and you're like, all right, you know, I'm clean and sober, but then you notice yourself just like getting addicted to Other like things. business yeah. for instance, yeah. or, or, or busyness, busyness. Yeah. yeah. Cortisol feels good. Right. Yeah. You're <laughs> addicted cortisol, to cortisol addiction's real. Cortisol feels good. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, yeah, I think so. I, I think, I don't think it's uncommon for addictive personalities to pick up on different things. I mean, I found snowboarding and bodybuilding and I'm 1000% addicted to those things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think for me, I, I told this gentleman yesterday who I love, I was just like, you know what? This is going to be, don't look at this as a punishment because it's not, man. Everyone wants you to go take care of oh, yourself. Because you love yourself. Yeah. Man. Look at this as an opportunity to go get well, mm -hmm. to disconnect from your phone, to disconnect from toxic relationships, to disconnect from uh, all the the worries and stress of, of the day-to-day -day business and, and feeling like everyone's counting on you. It's all going to fall apart. If you go, you're going to see that actually might've been frustrating some of these people mm. by, by, by the way you were being and, and, and not seeing it and let them show you that they got your back and they're going to take care of your baby or your business and, and your clients and all this stuff. And it's, you're going to come back and it's going to be better. And I told him one of the things that really helped me was him getting me to treatment and me trying. And I think I'm doing better than before of like slowing down, like yeah. slow down. One of my favorite moments of the day, 
uh, with Amy and, and we do it more days than not. And we like slow down. We have an intentional time of meditation. We set intentions beforehand. We connect with each other. We connect with ourself and then we can kind of go into our day, I guess, feeling really powered up, um, charged up for whatever's going to come. And I used to not do that at all. Yeah. That was, that was something I really wanted to talk about was the power of a uh, morning routine. Mm, yeah. I think, please. Yeah. Let's I, th- go. I think some people, um, do morning and night routine. Some people probably get like real crazy with it. Um, but I can, I can at least say from my personal experience, um, I had, uh, multiple times over many years where, um, you know, I'm, I'm super busy, right? I'm busy. I'm one of those people. Like I like distract myself with, with busyness right now. I have like multiple rental properties. I have the podcast that we do and I have uh, like a small media business. Um, and so, you know, I can kind of keep myself like infinitely busy. And there was multiple times over like years where I was going to the doctor and I had like really high blood pressure. Um, there was one time after I had like at 30, 31. Yeah. 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 Or even, or even earlier because it Hmm. it started like a few years ago. Um, there was one time after I had like been, it was like a, we had like a, I was in Australia and it was like a night out and I got drunk and, you know, we were in like the sun and I was dehydrated. Um, and i just felt awful for like, like past the hangover phase. I felt awful for like days. I went in and my blood pressure, they almost like put me into like the ER cause like my blood pressure. Um, and I was like, no, like, it'll, you know, I'll go home, sleep it off, that sort of thing. Um, and it was like, it like kept coming up and, um, I think I started, I started doing like a morning routine like this year. And I, I mean, I don't know, you know, it could, it could be a factor of other things like diet and that sort of thing, but that's the, the main thing that I've changed in my life. And my blood pressure dropped like so much. It's, I mean, it's within healthy ranges. My blood sugar is within healthy ranges. I have a much higher like tolerance to things like things like road rage have been drastically diminished. I haven't had a panic attack in like six, like three, four months at least, maybe awesome. more than that. Um, and it's, it's kind of like blown me away the, the effects I've seen. And I don't know if necessarily everybody, everyone will, but basically what I do is like, um, I do, when I wake up in the morning, I have like 30 ounces of water. It's like kind of the first thing that I do. And I put my phone away. Like I still have my alarm on my phone. I let it go off and then I just put it away. And I don't look at my phone until like noon. Um, cause I just would notice I'd find myself like scrolling on Instagram, you know? Um, and then I go into, I have like a little sauna. I go into the sauna and I do like a 20 minute sauna and, uh, like a 15 minute meditation. Um, just with like the little headspace app, um, I do a 15 minute meditation and then I do like a three minute cold shower. Nice. Um, and then, and then like a walk after that in the sun, um, to get, get that like morning sun in my eyes. And, and then no matter what, like once I'm done with that, then I can start work. And w- what I was doing before is just like waking up to an alarm, going through social media, getting right to work, chugging coffee. Cause I was tired, you know? that sort of thing. And I've just, I've noticed like crazy effects in my life. I don't know if you guys do mm-hmm. anything like that. No, that's, that's awesome that you say that because I think, I think it's a great point of starting your day proactive instead of reactive and then setting the tone of, of basically self care. Like I'm going to take care of myself. I'm not going to jack myself up on caffeine at the first of the day, let natural sunlight be the thing that wakes me up with my circadian rhythm or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. like get me awake naturally, like we're intended to, instead of something synthetic or putting something into my body. Um, yeah, man, that's, that's really good. I've, I've had waves of having great morning routines, good morning routines, and then not having morning routines at all. And, and I think Amy gave me the side eye because (laughs) I need, I need to get back on it where, um, yeah, I, I really need to get back on it because coming out of tree, I'm 218, 19, 20 days sober. And I was, I was really good about it for the first three, four, five, six months, something like that. And then have kind of, uh, tailed off. And so now, but the days I do it are the best good. days. Yeah. Yeah. Are the best days <laughs> the and the days I routine. don't. Yeah. 
Yeah, like um, for me too. And I missed, I have a pretty solid morning routine. She does. And, uh, She's a f- I get up early champ. and I read and I like meditate and I do Reiki and, you know, the whole thing and try to do some cold every day, some cold exposure. But she just today, did a cold shower before, she, yeah. before we came here. I oh, did because amazing. today I didn't. I didn't do any of it. I was too busy getting my own podcast out. Just life. Mm-hmm. My daughter's injured. And um, and so I just had too much to do. And it, it's such a difference. Yeah. Like I can mm-hmm. just tell in my mental state, like I was like, literally when I got in the shower to take a cold shower before this, I was standing there like, and Justin was like, I've never seen that look before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I don't know <laughs> yeah. what this is. But we were, yeah, it's we were just... We were out late last night. Um, yeah. Well, the the look real quick. I was She t- came I'm to t- give t- me a kiss and it was like, it wasn't even puckered. It was just like <laughs> it was there. Just, it was like, so I just, hanging. I just matched it where we just put our lips together <laughs> and we didn't even smooth. We didn't, you you know, just, just pushed each other's yeah. faces yeah. together. Yeah. I was like, okay, I guess just this is smush. what we're doing. <laughs> what is this look? What's this face? What's this kiss? But it's just such a difference when you miss when you miss that like yeah. you mm-hmm. just get in those habits and you can it's just noticing again like oh okay i need that yeah. to really set myself yeah. up yeah i think a lot of people are super skeptical about it i was super skeptical about it i had tried meditation a couple times and been like this is just doing nothing how can doing nothing be something <laughs> right. and i'm telling you it's the most something of anything of yeah. all the things i think the thing is that people try to fit people try to like fit other people's routines like mm, if yes. i try to do your routine amy I, i'd probably be like oh, i hate this like yeah. i i, I well, she, we her, need to when find she her reads, own thing. Yeah. when she reads she has like five books in front of her that are all open <laughs> yeah. earmarked and highlighted and one <laughs> sentence from one one <laughs> sentence from the it's, next it's, yeah it's the weirdest thing i see her read and i don't know if she she doesn't even complete a full page sometimes she's just like i'm ending quarter of the page through and i'm starting <laughs> over here on this one i'm gonna read all of this and then go to the next and i'm just like okay wow that's five different topics on five completely different things just, one's on finance one's on meditation one, one's on hope or one's on becoming supernatural like a joe dispenza thing i'm just like what is going on over there and uh so you're right you like make it your own tweak it to where you get the most out of it and if something doesn't work like switch it up yeah, like yeah. drop that and add this or tweak it a little bit and, yeah. um, and there's yeah, kind of really no good. excuse nowadays. Like we're all talking about it. Yeah. There's so many resources. You're not weird for, for we, doing no. it anymore. Yeah. We you know, know that it's like structure is good for you. Yeah. Like structure, mm-hmm. schedule, routine. You get your body ready to work out. You have a pre-workout routine. Mm-hmm. You probably have a pre-fight routine. Mm-hmm. You have a routine to get ready for bed. Yep. Like you should have a routine to get ready for the day. To wake mm-hmm. up. To wake to up. To get out and, of like this alternate dimension you were just in for eight hours. Yes. <laughs> and like how do you just wake up? You're like claw your way out of like literally like a fantasy alternate alternate dimension and then the first thing is just like the news on your phone like everything's terrible like that's yeah. not a good way to start your day or even worse just the alarm going off on yeah. your phone just like bang, bang. that's like the terrible way to wake up yeah, yeah. Great, let me wake up to an alarm yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> like a really stressful situation like, like the house is burning yeah, it's like an ambulance a police showing yeah. up or, yeah yeah we, yeah we have to be like intentional you have to be present mm. you guys are talking about setting intentions we're yeah. talking about being aware mm. if you can just be intentional present and aware like i feel like your entire life could change yeah yeah yeah, and like coming up with that, I mean, I also do uh, like a five minute journaling too. I write like three things that I'm grateful for. Um, but Gratitude. like it took yeah. months of me like trying different things. You know, at first it was like two and a half hours and I was like, this is too long for me, <laughs> you know? And now it's just, I know it's like these like five different things, boom, 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 that I do takes like maybe an hour and then, and then I can like have coffee and get right to work. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's been like life changing, honestly. Yeah, and I, I it's, I'm, I'm grateful you said that you go out and you get in the sun because that has been something I've been wanting to do um, for 10, 20 minutes uh, when I wake up. We have an ice bath downstairs. I used to be very regular getting in that thing three, five days a week, sometimes every every day of the week. And um, that, you know, obviously jolts you awake. Oh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> just being out in the sun, going and starting the day that way, I think is so beneficial. And Amy, you, you mentioned, and I mean, I kind of started off saying last night you were, you showed up and you were being a mentor for your mentee and it was her showcase. And then after that, we went and celebrated one of your friends, 40th birthdays, that's a musician and we were out late and you've been a caretaker for, for the last couple of weeks mm-hmm. for her. And so I think it's really interesting that you say that because you have been helping take care of everyone else. And, um, then you really notice it today. And so, um, and yeah. And so when I miss my own self care yeah. morning routine or just just those moments, even if it's 30 minutes devoting to that, it's, and I haven't worked out in like mm, two days. 
yeah. or even gone for a walk, you know? And so I'm like, oh shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta fill your own cup. Oh yeah. You do. You pour from and an empty I cup. can tell mine's like getting lower and lower. So mm. tomorrow I'm like, I'm setting myself up for success tomorrow. I'm sleeping enough. I'm doing the things. So yeah. Mm. Yeah, we're gonna do it. I'm gonna go for a walk in the morning. Yeah. I'm getting a nice bath. I'm going to do it. Thank you guys for in- inspiring me. And <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Me this it feels way. good, dude. You know, yeah. you walk by a window sometimes and the sun's shining through and you stop for a second because you feel it recharge you a little bit. Mm. Why, why wouldn't you do that morning, you know? Like, yeah. Just mm-hmm. start your morning off with a little recharge, even to, even if it's just that. feels good. No devices. You can set intentions, do gratitudes while you're at it. What are the, what are the, do you know Nick Gregoriades? Gregoriades. Gregoriades. I know the He's name. He's a BJJ yeah. guy. Okay. Um, yeah. He was, I think he was like- uh, he got his black belt from uh, Gracie. Okay. From what's his name? Oh, I can't. I just blanked his first. Where name. is he? In- um, he is now South he's African. In LA. Okay. But yeah. he's in LA. Yeah. yeah. We had him on the podcast the other day. Cool. And he said, "What? What? What were like the the four things? The four things? Yeah. yeah. It was exercise, um, time spent with friends, family, close ones, uh, exposure to natural sunlight, and sleep. Yeah. It's like if you just do those four things." Mm. Then it, yeah. your life will be infinitely better. You'll have you'll have filled your cup. You'll have less stress, less anxiety. Like you're just taking care of yourself. And you'd be surprised. I mean, that sounds so simple. And I think that that's like you you know you, you would know this from jujitsu uh, or bodybuilding. It's like yeah, but the simple things, the foundation is what makes you good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It, the you don't win a state, national, or world championship without mastering the fundamental fundamentals. Exactly. And doing those consistently. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, uh, something that's come into the jiu-jitsu world, uh, even at the lower level, is the higher level guys, they mastered all the fundamentals and now they can get a little flashy. And and there's new moves coming and the sport's always evolving and it's it's beautiful. It's exciting to see when someone can pull that stuff up, off. But there's a lot of the newer guys that just want to do that stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, because it looks cool. It is cool. The best in the world are doing it, but they are forgetting like, hey, these guys mastered the fundamentals first. And so they're going into matches and they're just getting destroyed by the fundamentals. But um, anyways, I, I don't know enough on that tangent. No, that's for, that's yeah. that's a literally a perfect yeah. uh, a, um, anecdote or example or whatever of... I think life for most people. Mm-hmm. I think you never really, no one really teaches you how to master the fundamentals of life. Those four are like good. Basic human are, needs. Are, those are four good <laughs> yeah. examples of them. And they're honestly neglected by so many people, you know? Yeah. And the Whether same- it's like you're busy working and you haven't called like your best friend in six months, yeah. you know? It's like yeah. little things, like I do this stuff all the time, but mm-hmm. it's like, I, I think that that's, it's just a good reminder for people, like those four basic things. Like if you do those every day, your life is going to be so much better. Yeah. Mm. The whole like no days off, sleep is for the birds. I'll sleep when I'm dead. Like that stuff. You got to take care of yourself, yeah. man. And I think you know we have I have a lot of athletes that come to me, and you know they want to build muscle, they want to burn fat, they want to hit the stage, they want to achieve these physique goals. And I think they're confused hmm. when I start talking about their sleep, their digestion, their stress management, their energy levels. But what about supersets? But, but what about <laughs> yeah. what about cardio, yeah. bro? What about carbs? I'm like, yo, basics first. You got to take care of your body. Yeah, your body is an organism that has to get into a position where it wants to change. More cardio isn't going to make it change if it's not already healthy. Yeah, if so you're sleeping three to four hours a night, like yeah, you're gonna you're going to do a lot more damage to you than good. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to have these basic foundations and Nick put it great. It's just some exercise, some natural sunlight exposure, mm-hmm. time spent with loved ones and sleep more quality yeah. sleep, yeah. not, not even drink just more, more sleep, like also. quality yeah. sleep, you know, and, and water. Yeah. 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 Drink and more drink, water. drink more water. Yeah. 30 ounces of water in the morning. Why do yeah. you do that? Um, Why 30 and not 24 or not 36? Just, uh, <laughs> just a random number that I okay. heard. I think it's a good amount because um, what's a liter? I know, I know at least a liter, liter like two 32 liters, two ounces or okay. so a little over 32 ounces. Okay. I do a hundred ounces of water a day, nice. um, of just water. Cause then I'm like, I, you know, the goal is like a gallon, yeah. but I just feel like hundred ounces is really easy for me to hit. And then between like other liquids and fruits and stuff like that, you get the rest of it. Um, but I do 30 cause it's like a third of everything I need to do in the day. And it's just like those little things, like you feel accomplished. It's kind of hard to have 30 ounces of water in the morning. Um, but, you know, starting off your day hydrated is the best thing you can do. Like chugging a cup of coffee first thing when you wake up is just setting your, is just like literally like l- l- just 
that's anxiety. Like that's what it is. Mm. <laughs> the per- Li- liquid anxiety. <laughs> it's liquid anxiety. <laughs> I'm dehydrated after not drinking water for eight hours while I'm sleeping. I wake up and I slam a cup of something that dehydrates dehydrate me even more. You and jack you up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get you in the fight or flight real quick. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, stay there all day. Yeah. Which yeah. most people do. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I'm loving this conversation. Uh, I'm really grateful that you guys are here and we got plenty more time, but I, I wanted to, to just dive into the strength to, or struggle to strength a little bit more. You, sh- you, you went through some of your story and maybe both of you guys have a moment or I was specifically thinking when I related to you, whenever you say you ran away, I ran away a few different times growing up. First time was in second grade. Then I ran away in sixth grade. Then I went and ran away in eighth grade. And then, and I, I wasn't the guy that just dipped out for a little bit. Like they had to find me and it would be late at night. It'd be in the middle of nowhere. Or it'd be all sorts of stuff. And, and what do you think is something you can look back at and learn from those times you ran or, I guess the moments of like having to, to overcome or lessons you've learned from some of those deepest, darkest times. And if you're willing to share a story, oh, of you, both of you. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I started running, I started noticing that I was running away as a young child. I didn't understand certain emotions that I was experiencing. I would get frustrated and I would lash out and usually physically or violently. Mm. Um, and to which I was taught to just walk away when I, cause we thought it was an anger issue. So when I feel angry, just walk away. But really that anger was a result of un- misunderstood emotion. So I didn't have the capacity to understand what I was feeling or why I was feeling it. And that would frustrate me. I would get angry. So I walk away. So this is kind of something that's been embedded in me uh, since a child. And I think the most important thing that I've learned over all of these struggles is presence and awareness when it comes down to it, just at its most basic foundation. Awareness of emotion, present in being grounded to be able to understand that emotion so that when I do experience myself in, you know, what we would consider your uh, window of tolerance, you know, where you are thinking clearly and logically, you can understand things that are happening, you can understand why you're feeling certain ways, you're inside your window window of tolerance. Something happens, a stressful life event, an anxiety comes into your mind, um, you know, whatever it may be will trigger you and you will now leave that window of tolerance. And so my awareness of being able to identify when I'm outside of that window was the first thing that I had to learn. Mm. So what am I feeling? Why am I feeling it? And this was a lot of therapy and going back to therapy, this was like a, you know, when I was younger, I was going to therapy because I needed help. And I was, you know, to the point where that was the only place left for me to go. And now I'm in therapy because I'm being proactive. So I'm proactive Mm. instead of reactive. Um, So identifying where I am in my window of tolerance, am I hyper aroused? Am I hyper vigilant? Am I in that anxious state where I kind of want to say or do anything just to get out of a certain situation? And that's my flight response. Mm. And so I know in fight or flight in that instance, I will flight and then I will shut down. So, and then, you know, you can't get any words out of me or, or whatever that may be. So awareness of where I am and working with therapy to identify what I'm feeling and why I'm feeling it. Now I know in my body, I know where my anxiety lives. I know where my depression lives. I know where my anger lives. I can feel it in my body. You know, my anxiety lives right underneath my sternum and I can feel it moving up towards my, the, towards my throat when I start to feel it come on. So I'm just being aware of things. I'm learning how to identify emotions before they're so strong that they're overpowering and I don't know how to respond to them. And I think that not every therapist has been able to teach me that. I'm very hands-on, I'm very kinesthetic. So having finally found someone who has challenged the way that I think, challenged the way that I feel things, and challenged me to pay more attention and be present in those moments where I find myself in a hypervigilant state, to be able to ground myself, to be able to think about what's present. You know, I do a a grounding exercise that actually my girlfriend taught me. Several deep breaths, eyes closed, either, you know, touching your leg or for me, it's my sternum because I'm usually anxious. So several deep breaths with eyes closed and eventually with my eyes closed, start thinking about, okay, what do I smell? 
you know, is there bacon that was cooking from this morning? Mm. Am I still smelling that leftover food that I had for lunch? Uh, you know, do I smell like the dogs are, are inside and near me and I can, I can smell things. What do I taste? Can I still taste anything from my most previous meal? Um, can I hear anything? Are there birds tripping outside? Like very specific. And then what do I feel? The pressure of the floor on my feet, you know, my clothes touching my body. If, you know, there's wind blowing by. And then finally I open my eyes and I just interact with my environment. And, you know, I'll get my hands dirty. I'll start cleaning. If I'm outside, I'll like touch the grass. I'll take my shoes off and walk and interact with my environment and interact with the people around me. That's my grounding exercise. So now I'm present. Now I'm within my window of tolerance. I can think logically. Now I can identify what that emotion was I feeling. Why was I feeling it and think critically through it mm -hmm. so that when I'm experiencing these struggles, these mental health struggles, I at least now have a process. Whereas before, I was just running mm. and it's been everything. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think it, it gives you that opportunity between this quick emotional reaction and like a thought through a response. response. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's a reaction. I was reacting to everything. Yeah. Whereas now I have the tools to be able to respond and it's changed my ability to communicate. It's changed my ability to self-assess. It's changed my ability to be present and aware and so ultimately it's, it's, it's reduced cortisol massively. It's reduced my stress. It's improved my relationships. Um, but I never would have gotten there without going through those struggles, without being, I, I, to identify those, those triggers, the signs. Yeah. And I think that people, when they're in those, those depths, when they're struggling that hard, yeah. it's easy to be like, why me? Why is this happening to me? Rather, what is this trying to teach you? Mm. This is a learning opportunity. And when you get out of this and you will, you're going to have a lot more information to better base your future off of. So as hard as it is to be grateful for those, I mean, you said you were, you were grateful mm -hmm. for those rock bottom moments. It's hard to be when you're in it. Yeah. But true. there was something that I found I was doing when I was going through all those, those struggles and, you know, hitting rock bottom. And, you know, I was thinking, well, it could be worse, it could be worse because you're right. It could be worse. And of course it seems like a, a inherently positive thing to say, you know, there, there are people who have it way worse but it was inherently negative because it could be worse, <laughs> yeah. right? Like it could be worse. You're so almost instead, inviting that in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's I'm, like a, I'm big you, on that. Yeah, can you, yeah. manifestation. Yeah. Can, you, can you say what you were sharing about that, uh, the little... Um, oh, yeah, it was a... What was that? I was at a retreat a and they were doing right? affirmations, but it was... Uh, uh, what I read is, it the other day and I was like, I love that one. And she goes, was, well, guess what, what it was. What is meant for me will find me. But they had had it as what is meant for me cannot miss me. And I was like, uh, no, that's not going to work. You can't put those negatives yeah, in there. You're just inviting that in. Yeah. But I, that was one question I was going to ask you guys too. Like how quickly are you to reframe something and what is your self-talk like around these situations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because just on that, Amy's helped me a lot. She's literally one of my biggest inspirations and, and daily you, you are because she has these daily practices. And I think, I think gratitude is a practice, even whenever it is those hard times, it's hard to be grateful in it. Mm -hmm. But if you can start practicing those things, but I stay one, super aware too, of just any words that I'm using, just like you were just talking about. Yeah. Because we, that awareness, we uh -huh. used to say, and I want you to definitely, us to definitely get this question in, but you, you whenever I used to say, I can't believe it. I say I can't. I can't. I believe can't it. believe it. Yeah. She she was like, stop that. Do y'all say, say that? I can believe it. I know people who do. I know people who do. Everybody cut that out. Yeah, everybody cut that out. And now I'm like, yeah. I can believe it. And I get everyone else around me. Because we say it around me. good things. Yeah. And then the universe is going to be like, oh well, they don't believe it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> be literal. People yeah. forget the universe <laughs> hears everything you say. Yeah. Your I, body hears everything you say. I learned something kind of crazy about that recently. I it's uh, fit, uh. What's it called? It's a type of like, it's type of physics, basically. There's a, there is a study that shows that like, um, certain, like when you, when you go really, really, really down, uh, far, like into, um, like atoms or whatever, the, when they were, when they were studying them, those, um, 
those like molecules behaved differently based on how the science like the scientists that were studying them were looking at them yeah as if they like knew that they were being and this is this this is in like Forbes this has been yes. this is like very this the is double like, blind study yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. where they know they're being watched yeah, I think maybe, I don't know if you can like look look up what it's called sure, sure. Um, like but quantum it, physics or something yeah, like yeah, that yeah. I, I, sh- I should have like thought about it no, before you're I good. started talking <laughs> you're but, good no this is uh, great <laughs> well the same but, thing with those plants right yeah like, you plants can too yeah speak life over or death over a plant it's going to respond yeah. yeah which is crazy to think about yeah. yeah it's not it's not atoms i think it's like mog it's, it's uh like quantum particles quantum yeah, yeah quantum physics i think is what mm-hmm. it's called quantum yeah, physics it is. so it, quantum yeah. physics what they found is that the um you know whatever atoms are made up of they behave differently based off of the observation of the scientist which sounds ridiculous <laughs> but this is this is yeah <laughs> exactly woo, yeah. but it's true it's and if true, you like yeah. look into this stuff it's like i don't necessarily know what that says but it basically like the universe there's an article in forbes that says like the universe um behaves differently based off of how you look at it mm. and that's what what we're talking about and there's actually basically scientific evidence to like prove that that's true yeah that, yeah exactly well, yeah. Yeah. and i i know this sounds um like maybe it's called even the double easier. slit experiment. The, that's it. That's yeah. Like yeah. 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 Slit it would, yes. they, the mar- yeah. the molecules. I know it sounds dirty. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they would, they would right. move like, through I'm different slits them. based off of study? like, yes. yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they would move through different like shapes, shaped slits based off of what they were measuring. And they, and they prove, I mean, it's like, you know, it's whether they were being observed or not. And if they weren't being observed, they were random. And if they were being observed, they would be behaving in the way that, the person was expecting them to yes. behave in a certain order. And exactly. it's that's a that's a really general way, but it's on Wikipedia if anybody yeah. wants this, to read This about. might sound like a big left turn here, but I, <laughs> nine, nine, nine times out of ten, when I talk to a guy that is that I'm I've been around a training partner or coaching, um, I know if they're gonna show up and win or not because mm. of the way they're talking about it. If, and if they're counting themselves out already before they get in there, if they're, they're, if they're just jazzed up, ready to go perform, like, this is my night. I'm so excited. Like, a, a, all the work's done and now I just got to go perform. But some guys will say, you know, it's a, it's a cool opportunity. I might win. I might not. It's like, yeah, you might not. You already lost. Yeah. yeah I might, lost. I might not. It's like, well, you're probably not, you know, yeah. like, Hey, let's, let's change that thing around. Mm-hmm. Um, and I almost think like more than 50% of the time, I, uh, it, it's funny because the fighters at the gym used to say, you, you, you know how to pick them. And I do it off the stare down a lot of times, like the stare down. And if, if a guy is just there for it, sometimes guys are over compensating during the stare yeah. down. You're like, uh, uh-uh, he's, mm. he's trying to overcompensate right now. Other guys just know I'm here. I'm coming for you. Other guys, they can't stay in it. You know, they won't look them in the eyes or they look away or they blinking all that stuff. And I'm like, I can basically pick it more than 50% of the time, I think, um, but just based off the stare down, well, we gotta, if they're coming or showing up. We'll consult with you before we get on DraftKings or anything. Like okay, that. all right, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least that, that's my theory. And and it's I think it comes down to mindset, belief in yourself, knowing that you, you've put in the work and now it's now it's your time to shine. Like, do why, why do it all that? You're essentially assessing energy. Yeah. yeah. Right? Do you yeah. think that people have a, a trouble with that because when they're young, they were t- they're told like not to be cocky? Yeah, I mean, the one guy I specifically was thinking about um, was getting ready for a world championship fight, and he was just saying, "Hey, I'm just happy to be here. You know, I can't believe I made it. I, I can't believe. Yeah. I can't believe. I can't believe I even made it here. And uh, I'm, I might not win, but you know, I'm here. And it, uh, I think he's super humble, raised by incredible parents, but but also came from not a lot. And then and then I think he was going through a whole lot of life stuff. Loved the guy to death. Um, and uh, but but mentally just just was thinking almost like he didn't deserve to be there he yeah. just happened to end up there by chance mm-hmm. somehow and i was like man you worked your whole life for this you gotta own that shit yeah yeah and i mean this is like getting into a whole other topic that we that we talk about a lot but like he doesn't he doesn't feel like he deserves to be there because his identity like he doesn't visualize himself as mm-hmm. like a world champion for instance or yeah and that's just that's just like this one example. A but. similar a similar background to me, where I grew up being bullied and picked on and overweight and and nipples twisted and all sorts of stuff like that. Where he just was, he was blown away that he even made it there. Yeah, and I think it was a real moment of of that 
I don't know if I deserve this thing. And there were some other outside factors that could have been playing a mind game with him. The day, I mean, he had a fever that set off like an hour before the fight and then right after he had the flu. So oh, wow. there, uh, he was probably sick before that, right? And some other things, mental factors and- Or did he manifest down. that sickness yeah. as an excuse? You know what? Yeah. You're talking my language now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Amy, I do want you to look something up for me because sure. I wanted What's them up? to be able to riff on this. Um, Josh brought up a great point. Uh, but Daryl Davis, uh, you're yeah. going to Google Daryl Davis and then do Stone Age. I think a quote will come up from him. I don't want to slaughter it. I don't want to butcher it. But um, he- We're living in space up. age times with Stone Age minds. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, Daryl yeah, like Davis is a man that I think they attribute more than anyone else that has African-American blues or jazz musician- He's been on Rogan's a couple of times. He's going to come be on this show. I'm really excited about that. Um, but he grew up and one of his stories is he showed up at 10 years old in the Boy Scouts and they picked him, I think in the national like Boy Scouts convention for him to lead the parade um, with a flag for at least his troop, if not like everybody. And he's leading and it's back in the 60s and um, maybe the 70s, but I think late 60s. And there was one group in the parade that decided to start throwing all sorts of stuff at him, a group of white people that he was an African American and they, they were just pelting this guy with food and trash and calling him all sorts of words. Um, and he thought he did something wrong. What did I do to hurt those people's feelings? What did I do to have them, you know, do this to me and hearing his story is so incredible, but he just said, his parents explained to him racism at 10 years old. They weren't there. He had to get back home, tell them what happened. All, all the people in his troop, you know, started protecting him, keeping these people, it was a traumatic experience for him. And he came back to a question of like, how can these people hate me when they don't even know me? And through his, that being his kind of guiding light, um, he's helped, I believe over a hundred people, if not 200 people leave the KKK. Oh yeah. Shows up at KK rallies, just has conversations with him. He's brilliant. He's smart, but he's incredibly compassionate. And I think that him going through that struggle has allowed him to find gratitude and even compassion towards people that legitimately hate him. He goes to cross burning ceremonies and all sorts of stuff. And he, he has a whole collection of, of KKK robes that they've turned in to him and like given him and he, and he's led people out of a life of hatred, helped them find a lot of hope and, and a new life. Um, but whenever you were talking about mindset and, and gratitude, I don't know why I thought of that, but what, what's the quote again, Amy? We're living in space age times with stone, stone age, age minds. minds. Yeah. And I think some, just all, all this conversation so far today, I'm just like, wow, you know, we do have the mind still of somebody that's like, checking for yeah. a saber tooth tiger and all that stuff. Right. And mm -hmm. we don't have those natural predators but, really anymore. At but all. on the flip side of that, it's like you were talking about saying we overcomplicate things when it's mm -hmm. very, very simple, mm -hmm. you know, when yeah. we really could just spend time with people we love, get mm -hmm. some sunshine, get some sleep. Like, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I mean, the goes perfect, both ways. <laughs> that, like, like you said, we kind of have like the animal minds in a way, like animals are almost better. I mean, animals are better off. Because like if you look at the um, the hormones and heart rate of like a gazelle, for instance, um, on the uh, on in like the savanna, when like a lion comes, you know, a lion's doing its thing, creeping, creeping, and the gazelle's eating, and then the lion runs at it. The gazelle, they go they go from like very low heart rate yeah, to jacked through the roof heart rate, and they <laughs> run really really fast. And if they get away. The lion gets tired, it stops. The gazelle stops like 200 feet away and its heart drops right back down Instantly. and it starts eating. It can still see the lion, but it just knows it's out of danger. Like we if you were a that. person, wow. your heart rate would be jacked up for like three months. You'd go into hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Tell yeah. everybody you'd about it. Start go a therapy. podcast about your yeah. life. You'd, you'd need an entire therapy. lifetime of therapy. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like our brains kind of like are our own worst enemy. It's mm. what's gotten us because we have that ability to, to worry about what if this, then this, then this, mm -hmm. then what if this? Well, what if happens if the lion gets hungry again? Or, and it, you know what I mean? We think about that stuff. That's what's allowed us to take over the planet. Mm. But that's also what like it's puts us strength, through all this torture. But yeah. a great weakness. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. And probably over 90% of the things we worry about are never going to fucking happen. Exactly. Yeah. You right? run through just scenarios worrying. that just probably I mean, will never happen. We're, and we're always in this fight or flight, high sympathetic state, high cortisol response. This is just the way that we are these days. I mean, yeah. back in back in Stone Age times, the only time that you had excessive cortisol spikes and excessive stress was if you had no food, you were being hunted by like a saber tooth tiger or something, or when you had no shelter. And you were exposed to the elements. Like that was really the only time things were super stressful. Whereas now you get, you get stressed when you get stuck in traffic on the way here. You get yeah. stressed, you get a cortisol response when you look at your phone in the morning. You get stressed when your boss is being a dick or like there's arguments with people like, or something happens. And now we have these, you know, developed minds that can give us these what if possibilities and you get stressed when you're not stressed because why aren't i stressed, why aren't I stressed? I stressed? something <laughs> seems like it should be wrong this is too good like things are doing too good and so we're constantly so much stimulus so yeah. much coming at us yeah. yeah we're always in fight or flight like yeah. you know we need to be more like the gazelle we got to chill a little bit more mm. that's the king yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah slow down yeah um i'm i'm wondering the struggle to strength i keep going back to that but how has your struggle the strength you found from your struggle been able to benefit somebody else. Like because you've struggled, you found strength and now you've been able to help somebody else through their struggle. That's that's my whole job. Yeah. That's yeah. my whole job. Let now. Me hear it. Yeah, that's my whole job. So during that time in 2017, um, now I had been a fit person. I had been in the weightlifting community for a while at that point. Um, I've been training for about 10 years. And um I had thoughts of- I can look like that in 10 years? <laughs> you look like this way less than 10 years. Yeah. I, sc I screwed up for about six of them. <laughs> way less than 10 years. But, um, you know, I had, I, had, I had toyed with the idea of turning my love for health and fitness into a profession. Um, I had also toyed with that idea of turning my love for snowboarding into a profession. And when I got into the industry, I was afraid that I was going to lose my passion. I was going to burn it. Mm. And so I got out and I was like, okay, I don't know if I want to risk this again. During that year in 2017, during my travel, I kind of had this realization that, you know, the entire time I was in recovery, I had my feeding tube. I was on my liquid diet, my soft food diet. All I was doing was learning about health and fitness. All I was doing was learning about how I was going to come back, how I was going to be stronger. And I realized that I was talking to a lot of people about it. I was helping them just candidly, just things that I, you know, enjoyed talking about. You know, I would be at the gym with my, uh, I decided to get certified as a personal trainer at that time. And I would have my feeding tube coming out of my face, tucked around my ear with my study materials on the treadmill and just wow. walking on the treadmill, just reading and learning. And so I decided that while I was gonna, you had a feeding tube, while I had a feeding tube, I just needed wow. to be in the environment. Yeah. I needed, to, I knew movement was good for me. I was in a really hard spot. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy to be in public. You know, I'm like, I had a feeding tube coming out of my face. I felt awkward. I felt weird. I felt stared at, but I knew movement was good for me and my community was in that gym. So that's where I went. And during that year, I got certified as a personal trainer and still wasn't fully committed until I started traveling the world, I came back and I said, you know, I, I want to help people. Um, I knew that was, you know, my purpose. Like that, that struggle led me to identify that a passion was actually my purpose. And so now mm -hmm. I coach people to not make the mistakes that I made when I started out. So not to have it take 10 years, to have it take more like three, you know, um, to give people the right information, the right education, and most importantly, the tools and a framework that they can replicate on their own so that they never have to question if, the, if what they're doing is right. They've learned what works for them. And it's not some cookie cutter, do this, do that kind of thing. It's let's figure out what works for you, how your body responds best, what routines work best for you. Because like we talked about, Amy, your routine might not work for everybody, but it works for you. So I want to help people figure out what works for them so we can not only transform their body, but their mind. And we can reach this sort of enlightened position of peak health, peak performance, peak fitness, peak spirituality through functional strength, nutrition, and mindset coaching. So everything I struggled with was a wake up call for what came next, which was just me like endlessly, relentlessly learning about this stuff. And now I get to help people avoid it. I love that. You get to pursue your purpose with passion and you get to give that gift 
to others. Mm -hmm. The gift that was given to you that either you found or others helped you with. And now you're giving that gift away. Yeah. And I like that you call it a gift. Cause like, like the same with you rock bottom moment, not pretty in the moment, mm -mm. you know, but you're right. It's a gift. I'm grateful. Wow. I like yeah. that. I like that. How about you, my man? Uh, well, the media business, is that where, you know, Curtis blades or Neil Magny from? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for the listeners, Curtis Blades, uh, I don't know if he's fighting for the championship next, but he's he's uh, right up there, um, mm -hmm. UFC heavyweight, really good guy. And Neil Magny was a, a veteran, and he's a stud. He's probably has as many UFC fights as, like, the top 10 guys. I mean, he's had, like, 20-plus yeah, fights, 30 fights. Now. Oh, wow. Yeah. The dude just is so active. Yeah. Yeah. So active. I, so I creeped a little bit and I saw, saw yeah. you with them and Corey Sanhagen. Yeah. Also at the gym, Drew Dober. Yeah. A lot of like, yeah. You, were you with Elevation Fight Team? I, I, I had trained up there some. Yeah. Okay. That was, uh, that was, I, I moved to Oklahoma and I was trained with Rafael Lovato Jr. But, um, yeah, I know all those guys. Yeah. And That's I awesome. would go in there and train. Yeah. Um, I was more with grudge fight team and then, uh, elevation as well, but I wasn't active at that time. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I started the, in 2020, um, basically like I was working at a job and like I said, not happy at all. And then COVID happened and I lost my job and I had just like, just bought a house and stuff. And, you know, it was like very stressful experience, but I realized like, I do not like the, I think the number one thing that was causing me stress and anxiety in my life was not, not like, you know, going in, working for somebody, having no creativity, having no like control or like autonomy, you know? Um, and what I loved, I like, I'm like in love with videography, photography. Um, and I always, I have crazy like imposter syndrome, you know, I'm like, this is, my work is terrible. Like I could never do, you know, I, I look at the stuff that other people do. And I'm like, that's so good. I could never do that, you know? Um, and just, I don't know, the experience of kind of uh, like, you know, suddenly losing my job and kind of realizing that that's not like the path that I, that I want to be on. Um, and kind of the guidance of like a mentor. He's like one of, one of my best friends, um, mentor, he's like a successful videographer telling me like, yeah, the work that you do is good. Like you could, you know, you obviously could get better, but you know, you could totally, um, do this professionally. Um, I just kind of like dove into that. Um, and I had been training, um, for like a, a year, a couple, a couple years. Um, and I had, so I had already gone to like high altitude martial mm. arts. Cody. Cody Donovan. Donovan yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 We train together a lot. At nice. Grudge. Yeah. Okay. He's a stud. Yeah. He's the man. Yeah. Yeah. I love, Such love a good Cody. Guy. Yeah. Yeah, shout out uh, High Altitude Martial Arts, yeah. Cody Donovan. Anyone who's in Denver has got to go yeah, check Nate it out Mark there. Yeah, Nate uh back in the day. Yeah. And yeah. Yep. Yeah, but yeah, so I was I was kind of, you know, training there. And then um, I I don't know how I got linked up with uh, his wife, Julie, and, you know, they needed some help and started doing some video stuff for the gym and then slowly started kind of working with, um, at, you know, Elevation. And I've been doing a bunch of photography, videography for like a lot of the UFC fighters there, which is cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Look like yeah. it was good work, man. It's yeah. good on you. Thank you. Uh, how how important is it to bet on yourself or take that leap of faith whenever maybe you've experienced loss? Maybe you've experienced, yeah. uh, and then you are you experience loss and grief, and you're going through all that shit, and then you're like uh, at the edge of a cliff saying, am I going to bet on myself? Yeah. Am I going to take this leap of faith? I mean, it's the only thing to do. Like, the, mm -hmm. like you got, I mean, what else are you going to do? You know, I think life is just too short. I think, I don't know. I just had like a crazy, like I said, I was kind of spiraling down like a, a dark path that I didn't like. I kind of saw that there was like a bottom <laughs> to it and I didn't, didn't want to hit that bottom at all. Um, and so I kind of pulled myself out of it, but I mean, I spent every single dime that I had and, and then some, you know, like I needed to buy camera gear. I needed to, you know, go, I needed to get courses and mentors and all that stuff. And I just put it all on my credit card and just figured it out. Um, and not prepared at all. Um, and that's, it worked out well for me, but I think that, you know, betting on yourself is just like the most important thing. Like there's really nothing else. Like what else are you going to do? What else are you going to spend that, that money on? You know what I mean? We, we did a, a funny podcast episode on this. It's, it's not, I mean, not super funny, but like we, <laughs> we, we were, it was funny because we were talking about starting the podcast, taking that leap of faith and starting our businesses 
and like what's the worst that happens yeah you know like what's the worst that happens we, we'll be able to make it through we've made it through everything else so far yeah you know so like what's really the worst that happens and even if you just think through that like worst case scenario of like it doesn't work out okay what am i going to do then i'll get a job at starbucks i yeah. don't know you know like I'll what's really the worst that happens and we started talking about well why shouldn't this work like there's hmm. far many more outrageous things on the internet or businesses that yeah. work in real life. We talked about there's a one of the most successful internet businesses um, that's like on this weird list of things that worked is this person who teaches cats how to use the toilet. Yeah. What? It's and a we coaching were like, program for <laughs> teaching cats how, how to, to use, use the, toilet. the toilet. So we were like, all right. <laughs> if is there person, anything more niche than yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> we were like, if this person can have a successful business, teaching cats how to use the toilet. I can be a freaking <laughs> photographer, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why not? Yeah. So <laughs> exactly, why not? Like, why wouldn't this work? And we, it, yeah. If we, it doesn't, who yeah. knows? Maybe I'll teach cats how to use the toilet. I got a backup plan, you know? We were yeah. talking about it because like a, a, one of the things that we talk about on our podcast is, you know, we try to relate to a lot of people who just like don't know what to do with their lives. Cause like, hmm. I think both of us were that for a, very, a really long yeah. time. And now we kind of have, you know, we have like plan, we have purpose, that sort of thing. Um, and I hear that all the time from people, which is like, hmm. well, I hate my job. I hate, everything that I do in my life, but like, I don't know how to do anything. And it's like, this person just knew how to toilet train cats. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, There's something you know how to do. You gotta know, you know how to do something. You know something. We live in the golden age of like information where you can, any idea that anything, anything that you know how to do, no matter how niche, you could go online and you could teach people how to do it for money. And you know, if you're miserable at your job making $60,000 a year, would you be happy teaching how to toilet train cats for $50,000 a year, $40,000 a year? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, what is your, what's the, like, what is holding you back from doing that stuff? You the know, fact yeah. that it doesn't exist already so many times, I think, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that you've never heard of it. And then yeah. suddenly you open your mind to that and you're like, wait, oh, well, I could just do that and toilet yeah. train cats like yeah. You, yeah. wait I've never heard of that existing you know I just interviewed someone on my podcast and he specialized in cannabis and he was studying all about cannabis and and getting more conscious with it and then he was also falling into coaching and using words and stuff and somebody was finally like will you coach me with cannabis and he was like huh yeah. and now he's a cannabis coach which is a novel thing that I hadn't heard of and so it's just about taking these pieces of your own puzzle and being like well, what if I just what if I just put them together? Yeah, put those words together, cat and toilet or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and just from my first initial judgment, I didn't, I wasn't a dick or anything. I don't think, but at, right at first, I was like, <laughs> oh, a cannabis coach, like because that was one of the. I can turn cannabis into oxy, like a, a strong opiate, and other people can have a vape pen for you guys are from Colorado. So uh, yeah. a vape pen for like a month or, or two yeah, weeks. That's me. Yeah. yeah same. Yeah. Yeah. I would have five, <laughs> five cartridges in a day um, wow. of like the one milligram or whatever a thousand. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was uh, a problem for me. But then whenever he came to our house, he was so cool. You wait till you hear the episode. Oh, it, it just came out. It's it excellent. Was so cool. And, yeah. and he barely uses it himself. He, he does it as like a meditative and like an explorative and super uh, intentional. Yes. Yeah, he's intentional super aware about it. Wasn't yeah. even like sometimes in sex and yeah. like he can do that. I, me knowing myself and my addiction, like I can't, Yeah, but like more power to this guy that he's having a successful business and getting out there and like helping people use it properly or like appropriately or like, um, and not, not in a way that that I had used it. And so I actually have a lot of respect. I'm like, holy smokes, like this guy's next level in this stuff. Yeah. But you just respect these people that have found their niche, like yeah. mm. whatever their passion, it is. Yeah. Their yeah. passion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is and everyone has something that they're passionate about. And if you haven't found it yet, that's okay. But like you will. It took me a lot of years me too. <laughs> yeah. for my puzzle pieces to fit together. Yeah. And it's, I think cutting yourself slack in that is crucial too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Amy, since we haven't shared it on the show and we're all just getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. Can you, can you tell them a little bit about your story and like finding music and, and writing a book? I mean, she's just, she's my inspiration, but I would love for you to share. Well, a little for bit me, about I think it just all came passion. down to my voice, voice and, uh, it just surprised me once it finally made sense. And 
I just encourage people to to take time to do the things that you're passionate about and trust that they're going to make sense down the road, you know, yeah. like just like you've been talking about. And that did for me. I I loved radio and it, it pushed me out of my comfort zone, but I love talking behind a mic and I love talking to people. And then I majored in philosophy, which didn't make any sense, you know, and religion. And, you know, I've just followed this sort of meandering path. But in my late 30s, some friends wanted to start a band and I fell into playing guitar and for the first time singing. Yeah. And late 30s. And wow. so I started yeah. singing and that was a real big push for me, too. But again, it was a voice. And again, I was song. I started songwriting. I started putting myself out there more. I, and then that fed into helping people overcome fear and rock their life, you know, and and overcome fear at any age and just go for it. And so all of this to say, once I fell into podcasting, it finally started to make sense. Oh, I'm using my voice. Oh, uh, these all these little things that I've done when people are like, what are you even what are you doing? Because this doesn't all make sense. And now it finally makes sense to me. So. I love that so much. Thanks, yeah. Thanks. The puzzle pieces is, is a perfect analogy for that. Cause I feel like a lot of people feel like they're just like wandering through life, like mm -hmm. going from one thing to another and like nothing that's like, what do I want to do? I was doing this and now I'm doing this and none of it makes sense. But you're right. Like you've picked up little pieces along the way mm -hmm. and they end up fitting together, even if you don't see it in the beginning. Yes. And even no matter what age you are too, you mm -hmm. know, I mean like That's I'm in the most my, important part. Yeah, yeah. It was like my late forties. It starts to make sense. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> finally, uh, but you know, just don't get discouraged. Just cut yourself some slack while you're doing it and trust that like, it's going to make sense. Like those struggles are the, know your struggle to K and O W the mm -hmm. strength and know that you're going to find that purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for, for me, I mean, Amy, by the way, you won't believe it, but she's 49, which I, is, is, yeah. is wild, right? I it's can't unreal. believe it. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> this is an appropriate time to use that. <laughs> it's the only one you get. Uh, but yes, it, it, the, the thing that I love, though, is Amy will see someone and hear someone with these limiting beliefs about themselves and about the life that they can live, whether it's me or people that come into your path. And they'll be like, oh, but I'm, I'm 32 now. And so I, you know, life's passed me by and I can't learn something new. Or I can't mm -hmm. start this I hate new that. thing. And I'm just like, holy mm -hmm. smokes. You know who you're talking to? Like, like get them. <laughs> I talked and, to uh, a woman today and she wants to be a singer. And she was like, well, I don't play any instruments. And I was like, well, I was 38 when I started playing guitar. And she was like, I'm 38. And I was like, oh, really? And she was like, but uh, the guitar, I tried, it hurts my fingers. And I go, fuck acoustic guitar. Just play an electric. Yeah. <laughs> she goes, well, I don't rock and roll. I go, well, then. Try it. They think you can soften it. You can make it sound nice. Anyway, and she just, I think it just kind of reframed. She goes, I'm so glad we had this conversation. And I was like, good. Oh, <laughs> I'm glad. So anyway, yeah, tangent. Sweet. But no, I think you guys tangent. are it's totally great. like in that mode. of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's going to keep on changing. Like, you know, you talk to older people and they say that they still don't know what they want to do. I, I think it's because of this. Like it, more puzzle pieces continue to fit together and you're just refining the whole time. I don't like, want them to stop. Maybe you're yeah. never done. Yeah. Maybe that's the point. Maybe Can, that's a good thing. We yeah. do frame that into something beautiful. Yeah. So my, I need you to look this up for me. Okay. But look up Colonel Sanders for me. Colonel Sanders yeah. age. Because my grandfather worked side by side with Colonel Sanders. Really? And he's, he's since passed, but he had started... My grandfather, Jerry, he had Jerry's crispy chicken down in like Mississippi and Louisiana and I think Tennessee and Georgia. And I'm pretty sure he got bought out by KFC and that's how he came along to work with the Colonel and was, uh, I don't well, know if I'd say right Well, he started KFC at 65. 65 years old. Wow. He's using his $105 monthly security check. Oh my God. Wow. Uh, yeah. He lived to be 90. But so. he didn't start wow. KFC. Kentucky Fried Chicken until he was 65 years old. And then he had my grandfather go into El Paso and Houston and Dallas and Atlanta and, and Memphis and everywhere starting KFCs and things, which which uh, I don't really eat that anymore. But uh, it, it was such a cool story hearing my grandfather. And I think from the colonel to also my grandfather being that way, an entrepreneur, is just always like, just go for it. Just go for it. Like life hasn't passed you by. Go for it. Like I think he was, my mom uh, has been my biggest fan and so positive, but my grandfather was the one that would, would come in and he's not even my biological grandfather. He was there when I was born. And, and, but anyways, he, he would 
let me believe when I was a bullied kid, like you can be a wrestler and you can be the best. And I was like, I can, (laughs) you know, like I I want to. (laughs) And he's like, yeah, you can. And I saw his belief in me. He shared, he shared his belief with me to where I could start believing in myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm forever grateful for that. And just these kinds of stories of like people that like, they didn't quit. I mean, I think, I think the Colonel had gone bankrupt and had lost everything. Yeah. And literally started on $105 of his social security check and like went all in saying, still going for it. Yeah. Why not? You only got to win once. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Win once. And wouldn't you rather like, wouldn't you rather at the end of everything, whenever that comes or whatever that is, wouldn't you rather just be like, Hey, at least I tried. You know, yeah, you gave your best effort. If you really envision, if you really visualize that like scene, the the last thing that you ever do, like, do you want to actually be like, oh, I never tried to do anything? You know, Th- to me, that's just completely off the table. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't. That would be the worst possible situation I could ever imagine. Like, it, way better to be a loser, to fail at every single thing you ever did, than to like have never tried anything. You know. I mean, yeah. I and just, maybe that's just redefining failure. Like then you didn't right. exactly fail because you you, you kept tried. on going. You're not. A, yeah. you, you can't fail you if you try lot. to do something. <laughs> you learn. Yeah, you learn a lot. And if you yeah. learn, that's success. Yeah. yeah. You're, I mean, a, you're a forever student. Yeah. It's not <laughs> yeah. win or lose. It's win or learn. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. No, I, I I really I really like that. I'm grateful. I, I might tease this on this episode, but it's for y'all's. I think. But there was a moment in my life that changed everything. And the thing that got me to say yes was a person asked me, if you don't, you'll always wonder what if, what if, what could have happened, what would have happened, what should have happened. And he goes, I think you gotta, because if you don't, and, and it was a scary thing and there was actual danger involved and all sorts of stuff. So I'll share it on y'all show. Um, but, uh, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. But, um, no, it's so true, man. Like, I think that's my greatest fear in life. Isn't, uh, what if I fail? It's what if I, what if I didn't do it? Like mm-hmm. what, what should I have done? Who could I have helped? Mm-hmm. Who could I have loved more? How could I have shown up better? Like what, what was my life supposed to be? If I would have said yes, mm-hmm. if I would have went through the struggle even more, leaned into it so that I found even more strength so that it could benefit not just me, but others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do y'all have a regular visualization process of success? Because you were mentioning that too. I wouldn't call it regular. Um, Yeah, same. Visualization is a hard skill. Like actually visualizing Mm -hmm. success in something. I haven't really nailed it. So I'm I'm down to take any pointers. I do it regularly, (laughs) but not like scheduled, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I do it like when I, if, like I, I try to, I go for like multiple, like, especially if I'm feeling burnt out or kind of, uh, you know, agitated, I'll go for walks. Like I love going for walks mm-hmm. sometimes just like no phone, no headphones, anything. I just go like, and it really like calms me down. That's usually when I do it, mm-hmm. but I don't have like a, I sit down and visualize time. It's just, but I do. Yeah. yeah. I, I do occasionally. And the first time I ever realized the power of visualization, I mean, in, in training, uh, you know, the goal is to progress every week, right? right. So obviously there's uh, some avenue that I'm looking to progress in every week. Either it's more weight, more reps, better intent, better execution, better range of motion, better mind-muscle connection. Something has to get better. But back before I was, I had that holistic approach to my training, it was like, you know, my goal was I wanted to deadlift 500 pounds for five reps. And I... I I missed it the first time I tried it. And I thought about that every single day for the next week until I did it again. And I didn't realize at the time what I was doing was I was visualizing it. But every single day I thought about it and I envisioned that lift in my head. And by the time I stepped up to the bar, it felt like I had been there before Hmm. and it felt like I had done it before. So it was easy. It came very easily. Yeah. And at that point, I realized that there was great power in that. It would be very valuable to to like incorporate that into a daily practice. I think you could use even that grounding technique that your girlfriend taught you that yeah. you were talking about. You know, you just convert that into a visualization of mm-hmm. 
that, like something like that. But what does it smell specific. like in the gym? What is the, what yeah. do the weights feel like in your yeah. hand? You know, that's what, yeah, that's something like the specifics of the environment mm-hmm. matter, right? Yeah, yeah. When I, when I lived at the Olympic training center, they would take you through and you would through sports psychologists. But what I really loved was when the Olympic gold medalist took it, took us through the same visualization because that was next level compared mm-hmm. to the guy that it was theory. Um, and a coach, but hadn't been there. They would say, what color singlet uniform are you wearing? Mm-hmm. What are your shoes? How did it feel putting them on? How'd you warm up? You know, see yourself stretching, see yourself bouncing around. What music are you listening to? Um, and then how's your opponent warming up? How, how does last match go if we're in the finals match? You know, what, what weaknesses did you see? What were his setups? What can you capitalize on? What, and, and just over and over and over, and you'd see it a hundred times in your head before you ever go out there and do it. And then the sports psychologist, a lot of times it was just feel the thrill of victory and only positive visualization. And it was a perfect match way to go and, and applause and all that stuff. And, and that's good. And, and we'd always in there with the Olympic gold medalists, but oftentimes they would take you through the struggle. Mm-hmm. It'd take you through a worst case scenario. You got down. He, he, he reversed you. You thought you had this move, but now you're on your back. Are you going to fight? Are you going to sink or swim? Are you going to let him pin you? Are you going to be embarrassed out there? Or are you going to dig deep and are you going to rise up and overcome? And so seeing yourself come out of that and work it out and then ending with like you having a just dominant match. But if you're there, you don't want to crumble right in, in real time. Mm-hmm. If you get put on your back, if you get down, you want to be able to know I've, it feels familiar. Hey, I've battled back in training. I've battled back in my mind. Like I'm not, I'm not going down here. Like I'm going to fight back and win. And so there's been some, some cool moments in my life. like visualization. My coach is saying, put state champion somewhere. You can see it. We promise you we'll make you a state champion to Olympic gold medalist. And I wrote down national champion, put it above my bed and a favorite wrestling move on the left and right pictures of them. And the first national championship I won was with the move on the left. The second national championship I won was with the move on the right. right. Like just seeing it when I go to bed, thinking about it when I wake up. And um, yeah, just to end that was my last fight. Uh, I went into the float tank and I was doing visualization. And I did a 60 minute one on like Monday before the fight on Friday. And I got out and I just didn't get in the flow of it. And it was kind of uncomfortable in there. It wasn't like the right temperature. And it was also kind of too short. I started getting into it maybe five minutes before it ended. And then I thought, oh man, I wish I had another hour. The owner saw me said, Hey, do you want to come back and do this again? I want to give you a two hour float. I'm like, yes, please. Thank you. So went back on Wednesday, went in there, got into the flow right away. And I had an opponent change on me. So that kind of is what I think threw me off on the the first visual, visualization and watching a film, mm. different things. Second time I was in there, it just flowed. It came to me. I watched more fight film. I came back in there, started thinking about it. Literally after I got out, I told my coach, I told my executive director of my nonprofit, I told my mom exactly how the fight was going to go. And uh, throwing a feint, coming out there, getting him to overreact. Whenever he comes over the top, I'm going to go under, I'm going to jab, go underneath. I'm going to throw him with a lateral drop. Then I'm going to, he's going to go to stand up in a suplex, basically the move on the left, the move on the right until I choke him out. And it happened exactly that way. I got out of there. Those three came to me and they're like, you told us, <laughs> you told us this is what was going to happen. And in the fight, it was just the flow. Mm-hmm. It was, everything was clicking. It was happening. I went in there confident. I knew he didn't want it like I wanted it. He hadn't thought about it like I thought about it. He didn't put in the effort. He didn't have the same reasons. But like just in that thing, it was like I was on almost on autopilot. Like there wasn't a moment of of struggle really because it was just I I, I was beating him to to it because I'd been there before. Yeah. And so that that's not how it always happens. And oftentimes that's not the ones you remember the most because mm-hmm. you oftentimes remember ones you had to dig deep, struggle and come back and win more than the highlights. Mm-hmm. But that for me was something special because it was like, whoa, power it's almost, of visualization. It's almost like a superpower. Like yeah. you could you could predict the future essentially at that point. I mean, you knew it was gonna happen before it did. Yeah, it was to wild. An extent. Yeah, and and a lot of coaching, a lot of people to give credit to, my training partners, all that stuff that helped me get there. But um yeah, it was it you was st- something. You still really gotta unique. do the work and do the thing. Yeah. yeah. And that's where I think a lot of people still get gotta tripped. show up. Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of people get tripped up with the stuff. They're like, well, I can't just visualize something and happening. It's like, yeah, no shit. Like we're not like that's not yeah. what we're saying. Mm. But if you're someone who's gonna put in the work and do the thing, this is gonna help you a lot to yeah. do it. You yeah. know what I mean? And even if you get off a little bit right. during it, 
like I could have just, you know, you're off course a little bit from the vi vision. You just get right back on it yeah. and once you're there yeah. instead of freaking out. It's, oh, it's not happening the way I wanted it to. That's, yeah. the, that's the power yeah. of like these like morning routines and habits too. Cause it's like, it doesn't matter. Like I, I'm kind of on vacation right now. I'm not doing it this morning. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not doing it every morning, but like when I get home, I, because I've done it so many times, like I just fall right back into it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the same thing. It's like, if you have some sort of basic plan of like what you're of the visualization of what you're going to do in your fight or like what you're going to do in the morning it's like you don't have to do it exactly all the time the entire time but it's something that you can f like quickly fall back into and it grounds you on those times when you do feel like scattered and lost and like you know f like you're freaking out which you know you run into like it's good to have like this thing that you can kind of snap back into mm -hmm. no here's the plan you know i don't need to worry about all this shit because Here's the plan. I'm going to jump back into this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. Me too. There was a, a study actually, speaking on a visualization, there was a study that was done that I read uh, years ago about three groups of trained individuals, like yes. intermediate trained individuals. And one group of them was weight training. Another group of them was doing nothing. They took time off from the gym. And a third group was just visualizing their weight training. Hmm. The group that did nothing, obviously, they fell off. Their strength was decreased throughout the duration of the study. The group that just visualized their training had almost significant strength ma maintenance. I believe maybe even gains. I think it was eighty five percent. It was of like what yeah, the weightlifting group did. Eighty five percent of what the weightlifting group did. So your visualization, yeah, yeah you still have to do the work. But if you visualize properly and you're specific, like we were talking about, like what color singlet, how did it feel putting the shoes on, mm. you can actually trick your brain into believing that you've done it before. <laughs> yeah. And especially yeah. something like like with weightlifting, I wonder maybe if they did the study over like five years, it wouldn't be 85%. Yeah, but probably. a lot of weightlifting is technique. It's not all- it's a lot of technique. And so the person who's doing nothing, you're going to fall off real quick. But if you're visualizing, mm -hmm. you're you're improving your, you're not necessarily growing your muscles over a short period of time, but you're your improving your technique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the importance of, of the intention and the yes. focus of while you're doing it. I think some people can just go through the motions. They just without move away from knowing, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And just slinging weights around. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's like, I'm not actually thinking of oh, this. I'm feeling this activate. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm feeling this. I'm, I'm tuning in to what I'm doing and why I'm doing it mm -hmm. and going into, to practice or the gym while you're driving in, seeing yourself do it before you get there. Yeah. And really like just tapping into that while you're actually doing it is, is so helpful. I'm actually at a new team now and they just explain every single scenario that's possible. And the only thing he can do or the only two options, but they break it down from basically the end in mind, like the mm -hmm. finish. You start from the finished product and then you work backwards and then you rework it again from front to back and you just get a, and it's so comprehensive. It's so long explaining each and every move, but it, it's for a reason and a purpose to where when you're there, you, you know why you're there mm -hmm. and, and you're beating this guy ahead. You're, you're two, three steps ahead of him. <clears throat> it's been really helpful. It's, it's been game changing for me. It's mm -hmm. the same process that you would follow for like it's pretty much the same process that you'd follow for anything. For anything the reason why most people fail businesses is because they don't start with the customer in mind. What is this very specific person that needs a very specific thing? Now let me design it. They just go, here's a product that I like. Let me make a better one. Does anyone want to buy this? No, your, <laughs> your company's failed. Like, you know what I mean? It's the same thing. You need to start with like the end in mind, go backwards and then work your way forward again. Kind of. Just so like you do that with anything too. You, like you mentioned be just being intentional. You do that with anything. Why am I doing what I'm doing right now? Yeah. Like you go for a walk. Why are you going for a walk? Is it to get steps or is it to be out in nature and calm yourself down? Like what everything done intentionally is going to help you be, be present. It's going to help you achieve success, but yeah, work backwards. Like, yeah. what do I want out of this? Okay. Now, how do I do this to get that? You know, what's so funny is, I mean, thinking about that from the, from the last fight to my first fight, my first fight was a blur, a literal blur. And it wasn't because I didn't always, I, I wanted to fight when I was 13 years old. And then at 19, I showed up as a coach and I was coaching some guy and he had a staph infection and couldn't fight. And so I was thrown in there. Uh, like the guy had watched me wrestle and said, you stay standing with this guy. You'll, 
you'll get knocked out, but you take this guy to the ground, you're going to smash him. You're going to knock him out. I was like, wait, what? I don't fight. <laughs> he's like, I've seen you. And I see that you're mad that he's, he was talking trash to the press and, um, because it was the weigh-ins and, uh, there was a press conference and he was, he was just saying, oh, he ended up in the hospital one night early. I was going to send him there anyways and different stuff. So I, I stepped up and did it, but this was my first real pro fight, right? I wasn't in the flow of it. I hadn't visualized it. It was just like, I guess I'm going to go grab him, throw him, hit him. And afterwards I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't have told you what had actually happened in the fight. But this last time, because I had been there and thought about it with the end in mind, it's like, oh, I, I was kind of on autopilot, but it wasn't a blur. Like, I you know everything, everything that happened and why it happened, because anyways, it's just kind of the difference of it. Once you start putting that stuff into practice, like there's levels to it where the first one was just like, I don't know. It was like a chaos. It was a melee. It yeah. was like a confused fight. It was, it was, it was just wild. Smashing all the buttons on the yeah. controller. Yeah. yeah. It just worked. And that's actually how I kind of finished him was hammer fist just hit through his face. Um, just hoping he'd, he'd go to sleep and he yeah. did. Thank you. But I was, this last time was, everything was methodical. There was a reason for it, right? It wasn't just chaos. And I think that's, that's, that's what's so cool about like, yeah, this this podcast has been great. I'm really grateful for you guys. Thanks, this was fun. Man. This is awesome. Yeah, this was a I surprise. Really yeah. on. This has been great. We could yeah. have been in here for 30 minutes or four or like hours. 50. I yeah. have yeah. no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been two, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and um, how can people support you guys? How can people follow you? How can people uh, reach out if they want to do that? Um, I'd love to encourage them already. Like go, go to these guys' podcasts, leave a review, yeah. share it out. I'm about to be on it. Go check our podcast we'll out We'll put together. everything in the show notes we too. Will. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um, our, our podcast is Struggle to Strength. It's on basically every single podcast platform. You Mike, know, if you want to pull that up too, I have a picture of there. Yeah, artwork so people can find. There you, you. go. There you go. Yeah. Look at those yeah. handsome gentlemen. Look at handsome. that. <laughs> if you've only been listening on Spotify or Apple, you might want to go back and watch on YouTube. These guys are very handsome. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Travis said, <laughs> "Yeah." Some people yeah. have called us the most <laughs> handsome podcasters in the world. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, we are we are on what YouTube. Would we be the Beauty and the Beast or something. They could be the oh. most handsome. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah the uh, the uh, we're on YouTube, Spotify, um, Apple, and. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram too. Uh, struggle number two strength. Um, yeah, struggle two strength pod. And then if you want to find us, for me, um, my Instagram is probably the best place to reach me. It's uh, at Travis Hawks Media. T R A V I S H A W K E S Media. Um, and I do like a ton of media stuff for a lot of different people. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, for me, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at Josh Levine Fitness. Levine is L E V I N E. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on TikTok too. I got on TikTok. I finally bit the bullet. I did it. Amy's on it. I'm on TikTok. It's great. Yeah. People want to learn on TikTok. Mm -hmm. So we provide a ton of educational resources on TikTok. Um, and then you can also, I have a Facebook group for anybody who's interested in bodybuilding, weightlifting, cool. health and fitness, uh, mindset, things like that. It's called Muscle Building Secrets. Um, and if you want a free download, you can go to musclebuildingmethod.com and it'll bring you all there and get a nutrition strategies guide and whatnot. That's great. Well, I'm excited to record y'all's pod tomorrow and maybe sometime we'll go out on the paddle boards with, uh, I would love that, with man. you guys. Yeah. I would love that. That'd yeah. be great. Amy, you in? Of course. Yeah. A nice, a nice well, sunrise nice. or sunset float. Oh, yeah. yeah. You guys morning or evening people like earlier risers or would you rather see a sunset sunrise or sunset? She's sunrise. I'm sunset. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. so, 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 but we'll, I can do either. I can yeah, do either. I was going to say, yes. so uh, we'll, we'll reach a go high medium noon and go <laughs> sunrise. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah. That's how you know this is going to be a good, this is a good relationship because yeah. the sunrise and the sunset people seem to always do really well. Really? Yeah. yeah, I think so. Oh, that's good news. <laughs> that is yeah. good news. Wasn't this a treat? Oh, it was wonderful. They yeah, great. so fun. This was great. Thanks, Thanks y'all so, so much. I hope ever, I can't wait to listen to your podcast too. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're excited for tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you guys for being here. Thank you. For really grateful. Us. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Hey, don't forget to send your overcome stories to overcomepodcast at gmail .com. and also rate, review, subscribe, and follow Overcome with Justin Wren.